I was tidying up my room when a call came through. Oh, my big sister! She lives with mom, so I've not seen her in a year. Blair! It's been a hot minute. How have you been? Hi, Karen. Well, not so good. Mom laughed. Oh no! What happened? Then Blair told me it's due to mom's debts. She had run away from the loan sharks and left my sister behind. That's awful! So I told her to come to Portland and live with us. She agreed to come, but then I realized that Blair staying here wasn't really down to me. Oh well, it's not like I could leave her in danger, right? So, later over dinner, I told my family about Blair's current situation. Oh, how terrible! Yes, Blair must come and stay. Yay! Their kindness didn't surprise me as my stepmom and stepsis, Chrissy, have been lovely to me ever since I moved in. You know what's even cooler? Christy is a rising teen pop star, but she's so sweet. We've grown super close, and she even told me all about her secret boyfriend, Damien. They'd been together long before Chrissy became famous, and had since kept their relationship out of the public eye. This is so exciting! I haven't seen Blair since our parents split. This guest bedroom is going to be hers, and we're living under one roof again. Blair's basically my alter ego. She's pretty, outgoing, and popular, while I'm more of a homebody. Come to think of it, I see a lot of Blair and Chrissy. They're both so extroverted and confident. They'll get along just great. But to everyone's surprise, Blair showed up looking completely different. Wow, it seems like living with Mom, a party animal, had clearly influenced Blair. Hello, Blair. I'm Stacy, and this is my daughter Chrissy. Welcome to Portland. You must be tired from your trip. Let me take your bag. Sure. Huh? Doesn't it seem like everyone's excited about Blair's arrival, all except for Blair? Maybe she's just tired. I showed Blair her room and helped her unpack. Oh my god, they're unbearable. How can you stand living with them? They think they're so much better than everyone else. What? Blair had only spoken to them for five seconds. Why she disliked them so much already? Give them a chance, they're really lovely. Blair's probably just stressed out from all the mom stuff. Hopefully with time, she'll see how great stepmom and Chrissy are. Only things didn't get any better. After class, both Chrissy and Blair came up to me. Hey, hey wanna, wanna hang, hang out? out? I asked her first. Oh, then we can all go together. Sorry, Chrissy. It's just that we haven't seen each other in ages, and there's a lot of catching up to do. Maybe we can go to Sephora tomorrow to check out that new Anastasia palette you like. Sure, have fun. Then Chrissy left. I'm sure she really wants us all to hang out. Oh, please. She thinks just because she's popular, she can always get her own way. She's mid. Okay, maybe it's best not to mention either of my sisters to one another to avoid World War III. Things went on like that for a while. I took turns to hang out with Blair and Chrissy. Once when Blair was chilling in my room, I noticed her smiling at her phone. Seemed like our homegirl had finally found something fun to enjoy around here. I excitedly asked her what she was watching. Look, isn't he cute? He goes to our school also. Wait, no it can't be. That's Damien, Chrissy's secret boyfriend. If Blair learns that the girl she hates is her crush's girlfriend, all hell will break loose. I think I'll ask him out. Really? He's so popular he must have hundreds of girls wrapped around his finger already. Besides, what if he's not into you? You'll only be rejected and get hurt. What do you mean? Am I not pretty enough? Oh, I see. You think that a popular guy like him is only suitable for your famous, fabulous other sister, Chrissy, don't you? No, no, that's not what I mean. You're gorgeous. In fact, out of his league. You deserve a guy who has time just for you. So why bother competing for attention from someone like him? Okay, thanks. But he's my type. I'll ask for his number Monday morning. Oh no, I just accidentally encouraged Blair to ask out Chrissy's boyfriend. I can't reveal that Chrissy and Damien are secretly together, but I can't let Blair steal someone else's boyfriend either. What a mess. I tossed and turned all night. Then when I woke up, I decided I'd just have to make Blair stop liking Damien. I don't condone catfishing, but right now it's the only way. Hey there, Blair, right? It's Damien here from math class. What you doing? A few seconds later, Blair replied, Oh my god, I was just thinking about getting your number. Looks like the first steps of my plan are working. I texted Blair as Damien regularly. I made sure he was a man of a thousand red flags. But for some puzzling reason, Blair seemed smitten with him. I gave him a seriously challengeable temperament. He could throw a tantrum one moment and become sweet the next. Then I photoshopped Damien's selfie into a photo of a messy bedroom, then sent it to Blair. Surely she couldn't abide by a narcissistic, messy guy like him. I'm so sorry, Damien, but I have to save my family. Huh? What? She sent back a picture of her room being messier than ever. She's always the clean freak around here. I had to see with my own eyes. Hey, may I borrow your hair curler? And what's with your room? 
So what if it's a bit untidy? Neat people are total psychos. Okay, it's time to get personal. Blair's biggest pet peeve was being commented on her look. So when she sent Damien a selfie, I didn't hold back. Babe, can't you dress more ladylike? And you really should cover up that awful tattoo. Voila, that's how you wake up the beast inside this fierce girl. <laughs> However, the next day, Blair showed up with a completely new look. Worse still, she walked straight over to Damien. I had to fake having an emergency to prevent a disaster from happening. Afterward, I texted Blair. I'm not ready to let everyone know about us yet. Please understand, babe. You know I like you. There, that should stop her from trying to approach him again. Even so, during lunch, Blair wouldn't stop blabbering about Damien and showing me his text. Isn't he quite rude? You don't normally let guys tell you what to do. He's not. He's just opinionated. I'm into that. No, he's horrible. I don't understand why you like him. He's sweet. You just don't know him like I do. Our love is complicated, but that's what makes it special. Seriously, you called that love? What do you know? Okay, little Miss Love Guru, if you're really that experienced, make that guy your boyfriend. Succeed, and I'll give out the love of my life. If not, I'll do as I please. What Blair is daring me to do was impossible. That guy, Adrian, is as popular as Damien. While Damien's the friendly one, Adrian is nicknamed Jack Frost due to his icy cold exterior. Rumor has it, no one has ever seen him crack a smile. Surrender, as expected. Then step aside, sister. Not knowing what else to do, I agreed to the bet. This is for Blair, for Chrissy, for Dad's happiness. Hi, Adrian, right? I, I, I'm, uh, are you free tonight? Or whenever. He gave me this cold glance, then went back to chatting with Damien. Please, I'm just trying to win a bet with my sister. One smile from you is enough to save the fate of an entire family and stop two girls becoming homeless. Can you just- Adrian gave me this odd look. Then he burst out laughing and took my hand. Sure thing. Can't wait for our date tonight. I left in a haze of confusion. That really just happened? Adrian must be messing around. But nope. He actually showed up at my doorstep that evening. This meant I'd won the bet, right? So I called Blair over to show her, but she just brushed it off. That proves nothing. Talk to me when Ice Boy professes his love for you. Man, I guess this means I'm going on a date. The tension in here was palpable. So I decided to break the awkward silence. Hey, where are we going? I mean, this isn't actually a real date, is it? It's definitely real. You insisted. I must have looked so dazed that he continued. Don't worry, I'm not messing with you. Anyway, I think you'll like where I'm taking you. I used to think he was incapable of smiling, but turns out he looks even cuter when he does. A drive through cinema? Wow! I'd seen these in old movies, but I had no idea it still existed. So, what's the deal with your sister Chrissy? You mentioned the bet? You know that Chrissy is my sister? Of course, it's not exactly hidden. Besides, I'm friends with Chrissy's boyfriend. So, you know? Yep, there's no secrets between me and Damien. And don't worry, I have his back. So, can you answer my question now? <laughs> I like this different side to Adrian. So before I could stop myself, I told him how the bet wasn't with Chrissy, but with my other sister, Blair. And I was catfishing Blair as Damien to protect my family, but it's barely working. Whoa, that's intense. Secrets make things complicated. Life sure would be easier if we could just be ourselves. So, why did you decide to go on a date with me? Don't you think it's weird? <laughs> no, not really. Beats how girls normally ask me out. I arrived home feeling on cloud nine, but then I walked past Chrissy's room and saw her upset. I asked her what's going on. It's Damien. He wants us to go public. But I told him I'm not ready yet. I like having this part of me private, and I don't want Damien to be open to backlash and scrutiny. But he didn't understand, and thought I was embarrassed of him. Oh, Chrissy, what a pain. Give him time, I'm sure he'll come around. But the school performance is in a few days. How am I supposed to take the stage in this state? I hated seeing Chrissy so downhearted like this, and I thought about Adrian and what he said during our date about honesty. I don't know much about the pressures of fame. But I do know that your feelings for Damien are real. I don't think love is something that you should hide. Honesty is the best policy. It might be hard at first, but you can get through it together. Now, come to my case, I should also follow my own advice and put an end to my catfishing before it gets out of hand. I tried hard to think of the best way to break this to Blair while we were walking to school the next day. After much hesitation, I pulled her aside before entering school for a talk. Only, before I could get to the main part, Damien walked past, and oddly, Blair didn't do so much as to blink. Seeing my confusion, she said, 
yesterday he ignored all of my messages. You're right. I deserve someone better. Anyway, what did you want to tell me? Oh, that, um, my date with Adrian was amazing. It all happened because of you. So, thanks. And sorry about Damien. It's okay. That's strange. Did my smitten sister really just give up that easily? But anyway, at least it's all over now. <sighs> and I don't even have to come clean anymore. The day of Chrissy's performance arrived. Me, Adrian, and Damien had backstage access. Actually, I'm here for emotional support as Chrissy is about to tell everyone about her relationship with Damien. This is a surprise for Damien too. He just thinks we're here to get a better view of Chrissy. <laughs> she slays the performance and the audience adored her. Thanks everyone. Thank you so much. Actually, today is an extra special day because I have something. But suddenly Blair stormed onto the stage and snatched Chrissy's mic. How about making it even more special with this breaking news? Everyone, she's had a secret boyfriend all this time. She made the poor guy hide in the shadow so she can keep her squeaky clean image. She's lied to you all for years. Is someone like that worthy of your support? Blair ran off as soon as she finished. Boos start coming from the crowd. Many people began commenting on the situation in true TMZ fashion. What is this, 2009 VMA? No way! My Chrissy is taken! Meanwhile, Chrissy had a panic attack and froze there on the stage. I didn't know what to do. Neither did Damien. Luckily, Adrian kept calm and grabbed the walkie-talkie, connected to Chrissy's in-ear. Chrissy, listen to me. In times like these, there's only one way out, and that's confronting the truth and taking back the narrative. I looked at Adrian and realized something about my own problem. More on that later. For now, let's see how Chrissy handles this. Well, there goes my big reveal. Yes, I'm in a relationship, but I only kept it quiet because I wanted to separate my personal life from my professional one. Being a public figure and a teenager at the same time is not as easy as you might think. So I didn't want to drag my loved one into that life too soon. On reflection, maybe this wasn't the best way to deal with this. I won't hide anything from my fans anymore, and those who truly support me won't judge or speak badly of my decision. Everyone, I want you to meet Damien, my boyfriend. The audience went wild! Aw, oh, this is so cute! But I still had one more problem to deal with. Blair! I look everywhere and finally found her hiding under the bleaches. Blair, it's just me. Please come out. I started to talk about what just happened, but Blair didn't want to hear it. I know everything! You trick me because you think I'm an idiot! La 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 la! I let her finish her outburst and calm down. Then I apologized and told her the truth. I only did it because I didn't want you going after a boy who's already taken. I know, I went about it in a completely wrong way. But I just wanted to keep our family together. I love you, and I don't want to be in the middle of your jealousy towards Chrissy anymore. If you just gave her a chance... You could have just been honest with me! This is all because you prefer Chrissy over me, don't you? No, of course not. I just wanted to protect you and for there to not be any more conflict between you and Chrissy. I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. Actually, I'm not jealous of Chrissy because she's famous and gorgeous. It's actually because you guys are really close. We used to be that close when our parents divorced and now it's like I've been replaced. Blair's honesty touched me in the feels. I gave her a big hug but then realized that we weren't alone. Actually, I'm jealous of you, Blair. You're all Kieran and Eva talks about. And I feel that, even though we're close, I can't compete with her real sister. Oh, so the tension between them wasn't just over a boy. It was actually over me. To me, you're both my real sisters, and I love you dearly. Come on, sisterly cuddle. Oh, by the way, how did you know that I was pretending to be Damien? I overheard your conversation with Chrissy. It didn't take much digging around to figure out it was you texting me, not the real Damien. While we're at it, I find it worrying you were still into him after all those red flags. In future, please let me vet your dates first. You're too easily blinded by good looks. Oh dear. That's why us girls have to stick together, especially when it comes to boys. Hi, I'm Aubrey, a super smart girl with an IQ of 200, and you should be ready for my mind-blowing story. Before I continue, please like and subscribe. I grew up in a small village in the countryside where people farm for a living. My family struggled to put food on the table so I could only attend a monastery school. But since childhood, I've always been kind of different. The system is crashing. Please wait for a moment. The chicken is $15.55 minus 15%. Cereal is $2.49. Potatoes, laundry detergent. So the total comes to $64.85 with the discounts and tax included. 
Mom soon realized I was a gifted child, so she helped me skip some grades, and by the age of five, I was already doing secondary school math. I always topped my classes, and other students would bribe me with candies to ask for help with their homework. At the age of eight, I scored 760 on the SAT math and won the spelling bee competition. I became a phenomenon in the area, and reporters even gave me the Stanford Bennett IQ test, which showed I had the same intelligence as a 22-year and 11-month-old person. My parents were super proud of me, especially my dad. Dad, they all gave me Lego and comics for rewards, as if I was an eight-year-old. Yeah, yeah, they're wrong. You're eight years and five months old already, little lady. He was the only one who could spark interesting conversations with me. That is, until he felt terribly ill. But good surgeons were nowhere to be found in this remote countryside, and we couldn't afford to take him to the center either. We were desperate to see a situation get worse and worse. Then he passed away, leaving us in the depths of despair. Soon after, Mom couldn't afford my school fees anymore, so I had to drop out. Aubrey, I'm so sorry. Don't worry, Mom. There's nothing that school can teach that I can't learn by myself. So she signed me up for a library membership, and turned out the best memories I cherished were here, where I could immerse myself in interesting knowledge from all around the world. I was walking down the aisle, absentmindedly running my fingers along the spines of the books, when one caught my eye and the memories of my dad rushed back to me. If he had been operated on, he'd not have lost. I started turning the first few pages and was captivated immediately. Then suddenly, a fiery desire sparked in my heart. I want to become a surgeon! So I studied every medical book I could find, especially the ones from this author, and decided to save money to enter medical school as soon as possible. To get closer to my dream, I moved out to the city and applied for a job at a coffee shop right next to the medical school. Only... You've broken 10 plates this week already. Are you trying to break a record? Come on, boss. It's just some plates. Not like I burned the whole shop or something. This will be deducted from your salary. Repeat this and you'll be fired. Okay, that's my fault, but I knew he wouldn't fire me. There's no one else who could memorize so many orders all at once. Even Diner Dash Master. Later, I was going to serve a group of students when I heard they were discussing an emergency case. We have to remove that blood clot in segment four of the liver and flush the left lobe. Definitely have to start at the middle hepatic vein. Is this dude serious? Absolutely not. A less intrusive cut would be along the falciform ligament to allow access to segment three. Everyone fell silent and looked at me like I was an alien. Suddenly, the middle-aged man among them stood up. Nice work, young lady. Your method is much more efficient than my student's answer. Which class are you in? Oh, I'm not a medical student but I aspire to be one day. The man asked me to sit down and continued asking me other medical questions, and I answered them all with ease. My adrenaline was rushing. Since my dad passed away, I hadn't had such an interesting discussion. Then, a few days later, the man came back and revealed that he was Dr. Sean Lewis and the principal of the medical school. OMG, you're my favorite author! I admire you so much! Thank you, young lady. Anyway, I came here today with an offer. I was impressed by the knowledge you have in the medical field, and I think you deserve a full expense scholarship to the most prestigious medical school. Can someone pinch me now? This was truly a blessing from heaven that I would definitely not let slip away. Here comes my first day. I went to school extra early to explore as much of the campus as possible. This place was so much bigger and better equipped than my old school. I was looking around the hallway to find my class when someone bumped into me. Oh, isn't it the gave the wrong answer guy at the cafe? He just coldly said sorry and hastily headed to the class over there. 412? It's my class too. I learned that he was Henry, the top student of the class. But obviously he wasn't that good. They'll see. All the theoretical classes didn't make me break a sweat, and I even spotted some mistakes made by the professors. When lunch rolled around, I went to the cafeteria, approaching the first group that caught my eye, and they seemed to be friendly. Want some of my fries? Potato fries contain a high amount of trans fat, which is associated with type 2 diabetes, heart disease, and obesity. One day you'll have a stroke, and then you'll know why. Thank me later. They all pouted and left right away. Did I say something wrong? Right then, a nice girl came to me. I'm Laura. Mind if I sit? Sure. Then she told me she was isolated too, just because she wasn't as smart as the other students here. Why are they so mean? Hey, why you gotta be bothered by those toxic people? Do they give you a penny for your thoughts? It's not about how many friends you make. It's about finding one that knows your worth. You're right. I'm Aubrey, by the way. I know, I was in the same class with you this morning. And the way you argue with our professor? Wow, that's impressive.
Laura and I quickly became friends. It's great to have her around who could truly see my brilliance and always encouraged me to express myself. Today came a big event. A conference was held by none other than Dr. Lewis. But little did I know that this event would become a battleground between Henry and I. Determined to impress Dr. Lewis, I eagerly raised my hand at every opportunity to answer his inquiries. Each time I did, Henry would swiftly raise his hand as well, competing for Dr. Lewis's attention. We argued back and forth, neither backing down until the end of the conference. After that, Dr. Lewis announced that there was one slot available in his upcoming research project, which would go to the top student of this term. The room buzzed with excitement and anticipation. My heart skipped a beat, for working with Dr. Lewis had been a lifelong dream. However, other students started cheering Henry's name. Jeez, I swore I would beat his butt off and show them who deserved it. Time to prove that I was not only unmatched in theory, but also in practice. I was the very first one to finish stitching up the incision. Uh-huh. But as I reached for my gauze, I couldn't find it anywhere. It must be around here, I swear. Oh no, I left it inside the dummy. Okay, this time must be better. How hard could it be to use this defibrillator? But then I accidentally touched the metal pad and got shocked and fell backward. I kept trying in many other practice sessions, but that sucked. Aubrey, this cast looks exactly like a chicken thigh. Do it again. But the most annoying thing was that Henry excelled in all of them and other students started mocking me. After that, I went outside for some fresh air and deep down, I was so disappointed in myself for all my failures. Suddenly, a hand gently patted my shoulder. It was Laura. I couldn't help but hug her and start sobbing. Laura, what if I was wrong about myself? I failed at everything and people started humiliating me. Oh, they just envy you. Nobody can beat your academic scores. That's why they gloated at your failure in practice. But that big brain of yours is what matters the most, right? Yeah? And an opportunity is coming your way. There is an intelligence contest next week. If you win, everyone will have to recognize that you're the best, including Henry. Talk about Laura, my savior. I'll try my best. Just wait and see. A few days later, Laura took me to the library in a private study room. She helped me set up my laptop and left me alone so I could focus. Good luck. I participated in an online oral contest over Skype. There was a panel of judges who asked questions, and all I had to do was answer them verbally. Easy peasy. Now I just need to wait for the results. The next day, I went to school as usual, but then suddenly was called to the principal's office. Dr. Lewis might have known about that competition and saw my name on the top list. I was about to brag about my performance when he accused me of helping other students cheat on their exam. Then he showed me a voice recording of me answering the questions. Wasn't that for the intelligence contest? But Laura said, Dr. Lewis, just wait. I can explain. I frantically called Laura, but she refused to pick up. Enough. I'm so disappointed in you. You're expelled from this moment. Feeling lost and crushed, I trudged myself to a bench in the schoolyard. Hey, are you okay? Okay? You're mocking me? Now that project slot is yours. Happy much? Get out of my sight now! Suddenly a stack of papers fell onto my lap. You might need this. Good luck. I believe you're not a cheater. I confusedly flipped through those papers to see that these were all of Henry's notes from the semester for practice lessons, which could not be found in normal textbooks or lectures. I kept on turning to the last page and saw a scribble. Know your worth. Something awakened inside me, so I swallowed my pride and ran after Henry. Hey, wait! I I've been wrong about you the whole time. I'm sorry. Don't be. It's my fault to act competitively, too. I had no bad intentions. It was just the motivation for me to study harder. I swear. But it's a pity if the medical industry loses someone like you. Um, well, I'm not so sure anymore. I'm used to doing everything so quickly and I can't be patient, which probably explains my clumsiness. That I can help with. Genius is 1% talent and 99% hard work, you know. Since then, I often went to Henry's house to practice. We studied together and he taught me many tips to stay calm, patient, and focused. And turns out, he's also quite the adorable type. Here you go. Thank you, doctor. This is the best stitch I've ever had. One day, I ran into Laura at a gas station. She tried to hide, but I ran straight there to catch her. How could you trick me like that and just disappear like nothing happened? I'm so sorry, Aubrey. I was so blind and just wanted to help those who are bad at studying like me. I never expected it to be that serious and you'd get expelled. And now, why are you here? It's just 
the medical profession was not my thing, so I quit. But Aubrey, please forgive me. I'm really ashamed of what I did, and you were the only one who had truly been kind to me. <sighs> only when you set things straight and confess everything to Dr. Lewis. But even so, there isn't a likely chance we'll be friends again. So the next day, Henry took Laura and I to see Dr. Lewis. Aubrey? Laura? What are you both doing here? Dr. Lewis, I... <sighs> I was the one behind the cheating case. Aubrey had no idea and didn't deserve to be punished for my fault. I've been practicing a lot too, sir. Look at these. I've been so careful with every single one. Aubrey has also helped me a lot on our project. I hope you can forgive her and grant her another chance. Dr. Lewis looked quite satisfied, but then he suddenly turned pensive and shook his head. Medical school is not where people can freely join and leave. A doctor needs an extra sharp mind and can be fooled as easily as you were. I'm sorry, Aubrey, but you're not qualified. My heart sank to my toes, and I locked myself inside my apartment for the next couple of days. It wasn't until Henry knocked at my door that I actually went outside. He said he wanted to cheer me up and bring me to his favorite restaurant. I sat down waiting while Henry went to get the drinks. Hey! But a second later, he slipped on the stairs and fell down with a thud with all the broken glass scattering around. It's all right. I, I think I only twisted my ankle. Not a big deal. But my stomach dropped when I noticed a trail of blood on the floor and something protruding from his ankle. A large shard of glass. I swiftly dialed a 911 while Henry winced in pain. Aubrey, you have to administer first aid. Oh, right. I called for the restaurant staff to get the first aid kit, but it was clear that the situation was dire. Henry's face grew pale as blood continued to trickle from the wound. I held the wound closed to stop the blood but my heart felt weak. I couldn't bear to see him suffer. You trust me, Henry? What do you mean? Yes? So I immediately pulled out the toolkit that I brought around in my purse. Henry bit down on the tablecloth beside us, and I started the procedure. I maintained a steady stream of chatter, trying to distract him from the pain, but it wasn't helping. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger. What? Just to distract myself from the pain. Okay, go ahead. Stand a little... Dollar. And done. When I looked up, there was a crowd cheering in awe and admiration. Guys, I caught the whole thing live. The video of the incident quickly went viral. That night, I tossed and turned in bed, unable to contain my excitement. I saved a human life. Reading the comments of the video filled me with a renewed sense of motivation to pursue my dream. The following morning, I was jolted awake by a notification on my phone. It was an email from Dr. Lewis himself. I headed to Dr. Lewis's office, and to my surprise, he told me he saw the video and gently said, Aubrey, I was once like you, arrogant and overly reliant on my natural intelligence. Then, a mistaken surgery left me with regret that I will carry with me for the rest of my life. However, after watching the video, I'm glad that you changed. I saw your humility and eagerness to learn, so I'll give you another chance. So, here I am. You have no idea how much I miss this hallway. Welcome back. How's your ankle doing? Much better, thanks to you. How about a celebration dinner tonight? Sounds great, but promise you won't need me to operate on you again. I was scared to death. Ahead of me still lay a long road, but I believe the day I become a skilled surgeon is closer than ever. And soon I can perform more life-saving surgeries for the less fortunate. Dad. I was sound asleep. When loud bangings jolted me awake, the cops busted in and immediately pinned me down. What are you doing? Let me go. Get away from me. Do you even know who I am? Rebecca Darlington, you're under arrest for stealing Mr. Woodley Jones's heirloom necklace. Anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. Stealing? What? No, I didn't do it. Let me go. Man, I got into big trouble that time. Oh, hey guys, I'm Rebecca. Believe it or not, it's actually my bizarre life story here. Before we start, please like and subscribe. My dad passed away when I was only five, so my mom had to step up and take over the entire family business on her own. And she was the biggest perfectionist on the planet, not just in business, but in the family too. Seriously, it's her way or no way. I hated this and always tried to rebel. However, mom always found a way to ruin my fun and forced me to study business instead. Ah, <sighs> boring. But lucky me, my brother, Kevin, always got my back. 
One morning over breakfast, mom decided to drop a bombshell on me. Rebecca, I've arranged you a date with Brian, the Woodley Jones's son. You are to go there for dinner and be on your best behavior. They are very affluent. They own half of the city. No chance. I'm not some pawn in your bid to gain business deals. If you ignore my orders, I'll transfer you to a boarding school all the way to Australia. You wouldn't. Don't test me, young lady. Perhaps you could arrange this date for another time when Rebecca has a time to digest it? If I wanted your input, I would have asked for it. He's my brother, and he has a say in this. Your adopted brother. It's about time he knows his place. Kevin looked so hurt, but still put a smile on for me. He's such an angel, just like his mom, Rosalie. Rosalie used to work here as a maid, and Kevin would often come play with me. But then she suddenly passed away, leaving Kevin all alone in this world. So mom adopted him out of pity. To me, Kevin's always been a family, and I will not let mom treat him like that. How about I let her have a taste of her own medicine? So I took mom's magic money card and went on a huge shopping splurge. Mom wouldn't be mad if her card missed a few zeros, right? Now let's get ready for the date. Ta-da! I look crazy, right? Take that, mom. No way will this Brian guy want a second date. Kevin kindly offered to drive me to my date. He reassured me it would be okay, then passed me a box of chocolates to give to Brian. Ugh, oh, Kevin. It was gone 9 p.m. when I strolled into the grand entrance hall of the Woodley Joneses' mansion. Brian's jaw dropped to the floor as soon as he saw my crazy look. Oh, but I didn't stop there. I first asked all the surfers to leave us alone, then made him nauseous with my table manners, and wowed him with my big appetite. I even sneaked bites of the chocolates meant for him and playfully fed him some. After dinner, I asked him to give me a tour of the mansion. But by the time we reached the jewelry room, my head was spinning. Then everything went blurry, and I blacked out. The next morning, I was already back at my house without any memories of how I got back. Then these cops came in and arrested me. Now I'm in this interrogation room being accused of stealing the Woodley Jones necklace. Apparently, it was quite pricey and had been handed down through 12 generations. You were at the scene of the crime. If you want to prove your innocence, then I suggest you start telling me what happened. Like I said, I went there for dinner, then fainted, and somehow woke up in my bed with cops everywhere. Stop lying. Brian was the one who was drugged, during which time you cut off the power so you wouldn't be caught on CCTV, then stole the necklace, didn't you? Okay, Mr. Policeman. Daniel Wright, I know you're trying to play good cop, bad cop with me, so I'll get to the point. Let me go, and I will ask my mom to pay you handsomely. You know her, right? Head of the Darlington conglomerate? Are you trying to bribe to law enforcement? You could get seven years in jail for this, plus the robbery sentence. I can assure you it wouldn't be less than ten years. T ten years? I, I didn't mean to. I just freaked out. I I'm rich, okay? I have everything I want. I, I wouldn't risk stealing something like that. You did send all the staff home, so there's no one to corroborate your story. How exactly did you get home? I told you I blacked out. All I know is I didn't do anything wrong. You couldn't find the necklace at my place or on me either. You have no evidence against me. Then enjoy a stay in a cell for 24 hours, in which time I shall find the proof I need to lock you away for a very long time. Wait, no, please trust me. Someone, anyone. This was so unfair. I just wanted to go home. Fortunately, that cop couldn't find any proof and had to let me go. Finally, after 24 hours behind cold bars, unjustly accused, all I need right now is a warm welcome from Mom and Kevin and a nice bath. But what I got was a slap in the face. How could you steal from the Woodley Joneses? Now they'll never do business with me again. Mom, I didn't do it. Why does nobody believe me? Would you look at yourself? Have you done anything good for this family? All you ever did was party, throw my hard-earned money out the window, then dare to cross me. You're no daughter of mine. Get out, now! I was shocked and heartbroken by her words. My own mother wouldn't believe me? So, I walked out. Just you wait, Mom. I'll prove it to you. I'm no thief. With Kevin's help, I rented a place not too far from home, but it was nowhere near the luxury I was used to. No worries. Once I proved myself innocent, things would get better. Now I just had to find that police guy, Daniel, that arrested me. He must have insight on the case, right? But when I arrived at the police station, I saw Daniel being scolded by his boss. You couldn't even solve the simplest case. Daniel, what has gotten into you? You're off the case. Jack, it's over to you. Leave it with me, sir. I won't let you down, like some incompetence. Huh, 
Sheesh, that Jack guy was such a douchebag. And Daniel sure did look glum about all of this. So I approached him and suggested we work together to find the culprit and kick Jack in the butt. At first, he refused, as apparently a suspect participating in the investigation was not procedure. Relax, it's not like I want access to classified documents or anything. Think of it as working with a suspect. If we cooperate, you can monitor me to see if I really am the culprit. It's a win-win. It's not like that. I'm no longer on the case. Jeez, I didn't expect you to give up so easily. So much for being a pro. Maybe your boss was right to reassign the case. <laughs> Who are you to judge me? You're still the number one suspect in this case, and I got my eyes on you, thief. So, is that a yes? Ugh, fine. Bingo. Surely there's no place better to hunt for clues than the crime scene, right? But Brian's mansion was locked down and had security everywhere. Luckily, Daniel told me he'd already studied the house's layout and knew that the only way to intrude without being noticed was through this door. Yes, folks, you heard it right. A dog door. The bar couldn't get any lower, could it? Just shut up. We sneaked through it and ended up in the staff kitchen. The main building has already been fully swept, as that's where we knew the main suspect was. The staff quarters weren't a focus point. Daniel launched into a CSI mode, checking the area for footprints, and I watched with fascination. He found a strange shoe print, which didn't belong to any of the staff, as they were required to wear uniform shoes. This type of shoe print is rare. This could be a big clue. I didn't want him to start accusing me again, so I wiggled my foot about. Ahem, it's obviously not my tiny size six feet. <laughs> I didn't say a thing about you. This obviously belonged to a man with size 12 feet. Is it your accomplice? Is he Bigfoot or something? Are you crazy? Who's accomplice, you madcap? Shush, are you trying to get us caught? Oopsie, just then, we heard running footsteps coming our way. Shoot, we gotta get out. The only escape is through this window. Again? Oh, what a burden. Daniel grabbed my hand, then we both jumped through the window. Smack! His shoe was right up my face. Ouch! Get your dirty foot off me! I tried getting up, and we ended up kissing. My... My first kiss. Wait, what is that sound? I turned around to see two big dogs growling at us. We run on the count of three, okay? One, just run! We ran straight to the road and caught a taxi, leaving behind those vicious dogs. Uh, your hand? Um. Oh, mm, sorry. It was because of those dogs. Is being chased by dogs the in-trend? A few nights ago, I saw those exact two dogs chasing another man along this road. Daniel immediately asked the driver to show him his dashcam footage. It showed this tall, masked man in all black coming out of Brian's house. A shiver ran through me at the sight of him. There was something unsettlingly familiar. The next day, Daniel made me traipse into at least a dozen different shoe stores so he could ask the staff about the soul print we'd found last night, but no luck. The scorching sun was getting to me, so Daniel brought out this umbrella. Cute, huh? If only this big hole hadn't been directly above me. By lunchtime, I saw Daniel sweating in the heat, so I grabbed a tissue to wipe for him. The heat rose as we were so close, but once done, he was even more oily. <laughs> we were just like two peas in a pod. Later that day, we made it to this ancient shoe shop that said it was a Leighton, a brand that made customized handmade shoes. Wait, I've heard about that exclusive brand before, but... If someone could afford these shoes, why would they go out and about stealing? Daniel seemed to agree, and the investigation was at a dead end. The truth is, I had my suspicions about who the real thief was, so I went back to the crime scene to see if I could find any evidence. Daniel did say this dog door was the only other way in, so I searched around the area and spotted this shiny bracelet in a bush. Oh, I know who this belongs to. So, I've asked him to meet me here. I found your bracelet. Thank you so much. You know how important this is to me. The bracelet is a keepsake for my mom. She gave it to me before she passed away. I found it at Brian's house. The night you drove me to Brian's, did you go straight home afterward? Y yeah, of course. I've been on the investigation for a couple of days and found that the thief wore size 12 latent shoes. I gave you a pair for your birthday. The thief was also identified by a taxi driver's dash cam as a male, around 5 foot 10, the exact body figure of you. And now this bracelet? The coincidences are stacking up, but I can't believe it. Not without your explanation. After all, you are my brother. Y yes, it was me, but I had no other choice. I actually have a sister, a half-sister from my dad's side, and she's going through surgery. I really needed the money to pay her bills. I might look successful on the outside, but I work for your mom unpaid. Don't get me wrong, I'm grateful for all she's done for me, and I couldn't ask her for more, so I took the risk. Why didn't you tell me? I can help you. 
You were always embroiled in arguments with your mom, so I don't want to burden you further. And you only seem to need me when you're in trouble. That's true. Thinking back, we rarely talked. Even when we talked, it was always me complaining about mom to him without realizing mom has been the hardest on him. I hated what he did, but I knew he only did it to save his sister, and I felt terrible that I'd had Kevin's love and care all of these years, and she hadn't. Kevin, don't worry. Just leave it to me. The next day, Daniel came to see me and told me the police department had just found new evidence against me. The chocolates I'd given to Brian that night contained anesthetics. It all sounds very suspicious to me and may just change the direction of my investigation. Are you investigating me now? No, it's highly possible that the real culprit wanted to target you. I need your cooperation. We have to hurry before they blame it all on you. Who helped you prepare the present that day? No one. I bought them at the store. I felt awful lying to Daniel, but I couldn't let Kevin go down for this. Not when his sister needed him. It was time for me to put an end to this devastating chain of events. I went to the police station and confessed to stealing the necklace. They arrested me, and right at that moment, Daniel stepped in, surprised. Rebecca, what are you doing here? Let her go! What are you doing? We can't arrest her without evidence. Daniel, it's okay. I already confessed. What? That's nonsense. I insisted that I did it, and he had no choice but to let them arrest me. I know it's not that simple, Rebecca, and I'm going to prove it. Daniel was right. Everything was off about this trial. First, this Jack guy had somehow swapped all the evidence against Kevin to me, from my shoe prints on the staff kitchen to the recording from the taxi driver. Plus, the necklace was later found in Miss Rebecca Darlington's bedroom. It was never there in the first place. I wanted to speak up for myself, but that douchebag Jack shut me up. The judge was about to sentence me when Daniel kicked the door and barged in. Stop, Your Honor. I believe all the evidence presented to you was faked by him. The whole court bursted out in surprise. Turns out Daniel's boss had suspected Jack was a rotten apple, so he actually wanted to use this chance to expose him. He pretended to kick Daniel out of the case and appointed Jack instead to lure him into the trap. As predicted, after I confessed to the crime, Daniel followed Jack and saw that he was taking bribes from Kevin. Well paid. I'll fake the evidence. Rebecca will go down for this. Don't mess it up. It's tricky enough to get that brat to take the blame for me. He played me? There was no half-sister who's in the hospital? Ugh, don't look at me like that. My real mom only died because of your mom, Don Darlington. That woman flagrantly accused her of stealing. Mom was so distraught, she had a heart attack and... and passed away. Don only adopted me out of guilt, and she treated me like garbage, making me run around for you. So I decided to take revenge, show them how being wrongly accused of something can ruin lives. But look where vengeance got him. He was a monster, and I really wondered, was it really worth it? In the end, both Jack and Kevin went to jail. Unfortunately, without Kevin as key personnel to help out with my family business, it went into turmoil. So I offered to help mom with it. You do that, after everything I put you through. We're a family. I also felt bad for taking you and what you provide me for granted. I'm so ashamed of how I treated you. I've been cold, controlling, and unfair on you and Kevin. It's my fault he turned against us and sought revenge. Mom, it must have been hard for you running the business and caring for me and Kevin, especially without Dad. I forgive you and want to just put it behind us and start again. Now, I just had one last person to make amends with. Rebecca, I... I didn't think you'd ever want to see me again. I didn't. I was so mad, but then I realized that being that way was getting me nowhere. To forgive others means forgiving and liberating ourselves. I walked out of the prison feeling much more positive about it all and saw Daniel waiting for me. Say, we make a good team. What do you think about being my partner? Partner? For investigative purposes or for life? Hmm, how about both? Aha! A snowstorm's coming! Perfect for a race. Let's go, my loyal soldiers! Looks like a big storm, guys. Shall we head home? Scared already? Cowards! I was born and raised in the snow. This is nothing! Then I signaled for Bam and Holly to speed up, but they stopped and barked nonstop instead. Is that pile of snow moving? I hurriedly ran over to check. OMG! It's a boy! No, an angel with blonde hair. My heart was racing. Is this love at first sight? Uh, help me. 
No matter how much Eldon and Era objected, I insisted on bringing this guy back to my place. I had to take care of him myself. Oh, looks like he'd woken up. Are you okay? Where am I? You're in my house. I'm Brenna, by the way. I found- Oh, God. Huh? What's wrong? Something on my face? Um, no. It's just that you're too beautiful. Like a real-life Snow White. Then he said his name's Beavis. He came here to travel, but unfortunately was met by the snowstorm. Yeah, it's gonna snow heavily in the next couple of days, so you should stay here until you recover. After a few days, Beavis got better, so I showed him around. On the sledge. Although Bam and Holly were practically just walking, Beavis still freaked out so much, he huddled up against me. <laughs> Hold on tight! I'm speeding up! We went up a hill, then through a pine forest and arrived at, ta-da, probably the biggest frozen lake he had ever seen. I taught Beavis how to drill a hole in the ice, then he excitedly dropped the fishing line. The following days, I continued taking him sightseeing, and we were basically inseparable. We went to see polar bears kayaking among the icebergs. I taught him how to make instant snow by spraying boiling water into the cold air, and we even watched the spectacular auroras together. Wow, I've never seen such beautiful scenery before. Yeah, and I'd never seen such a beautiful face before. Just like that, Beavis spent day after another with me here in the Arctic. It's been so much fun, but for some reason, my friends Eldon and Era were not having any of it. They seemed to hold grudges against him or something. One time when I was arranging supplies in the root cellar, I heard Beavis's ear-piercing scream. I hurriedly checked and saw a white fox dashing out, followed by giggles outside the window. You're such a chicken, big city boy. It's just an extra-large kitty. Then Eldon and Era burst into laughter. Ugh, can those two show a little hospitality? At dinner, I cooked him my signature dish as an apology to Beavis for those naughty friends of mine. He was totally cool about it and even told me stories about his friends back at home and about their lives in Florida. Whoa, it sounds so magical. I wish I could lounge around on a beach and soak up the sun while enjoying my coconut drink too. I went to sleep dreaming about the beautiful urban life. Suddenly, a knock on my bedroom door woke me up. I stumbled to answer it and saw Beavis. Hey, Brenna, could you take me to the toilet? It's too dark outside, and that fox might come back. <laughs> How cute! He's really good at coming up with excuses to be with me. W while waiting for Beavis, I planned out what we're going to do tomorrow. As he got back from the outhouse, ooh, I couldn't contain my excitement and told him right away. Uh, <clears throat> hey, I'm all better now. Maybe it's time for me to go home. Huh? Why so sudden? I'm sorry, but I really can't take this anymore. No, how could my first love end this fast? It hasn't even started. Brenna, it's so tough for me to live here. I don't want to boil ice every time I need a cup of water or go to the toilet out in the freezing cold. And how tiring that we can only go around on sleds. But even if we had a car, there's literally nowhere to go in this gloomy place. But still, I've endured it all this whole time because I can't leave you. I think I'm in love with you. Beavis, I... How about you going to the city with me so that we could stay together? Oh my, it turned out that we both have feelings for each other, but because of that, he had to suffer in silence. Such a sweet guy. And it's true, he wasn't built for this harsh climate. He didn't belong here. The next morning, I told Eldon and Era that I wanted to hang out in Miami for some days. Rana, I don't think it's a good idea. That pansy boy must have coaxed you to do this. Don't buy those sweet words. I tried my best to explain how nice and polite Beavis was, but they wouldn't listen. Girl, he got you all blinded. You've only known him for a few days, not enough to tell what kind of person he is. Can't believe you're just one of those shallow girls. Who are you calling shallow? Yeah, right. I was blinded. Blinded by his kindness. Then I stormed off, leaving Eldon and Ira behind. I just worry about you. Yeah, right. Worry? Or are you just jealous of me? I came home to a shivering Beavis. He couldn't stand this freezing weather anymore, and I couldn't bear seeing him like this either. So I told Beavis that I would go with him. Look how happy Beavis was, and I too was excited to visit his hometown. It's gonna be fun. It took only less than two days for us to arrange things out, buy the tickets, ask Era to look after Bam and Holly, and we're good to go. After a long flight, we're finally here. It looks like a completely different world in front of my eyes. Crowds of people rushing left and right. Suddenly, I spotted something. Oh, that looks just like my Holly. What a spoiled husky. At that age, my two buddies were already the best sled dogs in the area. Oopsie. City folks don't seem too friendly, do they? Huh? What else? Why is it moving so fast and nonstop? While I hesitated to take a stab, Beavis suddenly carried me up in the air. Don't worry, I got you. 
Oh boy, he's so sweet. Beavis then got me transformed into a city girl. He took me shopping, then got my hair dyed. I really like my silky black hair, but Beavis said this looked better on me. This too, baby girl. This is a tattoo parlor, isn't it? Seeing my confusion, Beavis explained that couples here usually get tattooed on important occasions, and today marks the first day that you walk into my world, so I want it imprinted in my heart. So Beavis and I got matching tattoos that he chose, a weird-looking red shape behind the ears. It might not look pretty, but was definitely unique enough to be special for just us two. Once we were done shopping, we went to a luxurious villa. Oh my, is he taking me to his parents? I'm so nervous, not sure how I should behave when Beavis comforted me. They were nice, don't worry, just do as they tell you to. Just then, the main door opened. Everyone turned to look at us full of excitement. This must be the first time Beavis took his girlfriend home then. Uh, hello, hello everyone. I... Suddenly a man walked straight over and lifted my chin. Very similar, but... But this, but that. Just look at her birthmark. It's Demi. Thank, Thank goodness. goodness. Our, Our beloved daughter, daughter has returned. returned. I was still processing everything when everyone rushed to hug me and bombarded me with questions. I turned to Beavis for help, but where is he? What's going on? I tried to explain that I was Brenna, born in the snowy Arctic. Both my parents had passed away and this was my first time leaving my hometown, but to no avail. My precious daughter, Beavis told us everything. You fell in the woods and had a concussion, so you're having a temporary memory loss. Just get rested for now, okay? Oh, where is Beavis then? I gotta ask him something. Don't worry, your savior will be well rewarded. You'll see him tomorrow. <sighs> everything happens so fast, I'm totally lost. But the most I could do now is to wait until tomorrow. I'm sure Beavis will clear things up. Upon catching sight of Beavis, I immediately unloaded it all onto him. Shush, just listen to me first. Turned out, Beavis worked here for the Atchley's family. He escorted their daughter, Demi, on a trip to the mountains, but she ran away. Mrs. Atchley was utterly furious about this and used his ill mother to blackmail him into finding Demi. That's why he risked going out into the snowstorm where we met. But why me? I have nothing to do with Demi. You and Demi look just like twins. <gasps> when I saw you, I couldn't believe my eyes either. I did what I did because I was worried for my mom. I hope you can forgive me and help us, please. I'll soon find Demi. So, you were only using me? No, I'm truly in love with you, Brenna. I didn't want to be away from you, and you deserve a much better life here, with me. But... Just wait until I find Demi, then we will run away and live happily together. Poor Beavis. He seriously had the worst luck. If I were him, I guess I would do the same. So I reluctantly lived as Demi. Luckily, her parents thought I lost my memory, which made it not too hard to be her. One day, I received a text from Eldon. I suddenly remembered that I'd been away from home for almost a month. I wonder if Bam and Holly miss me. To say I was not one bit homesick would be a lie. But there's no way I'd speak to Eldon. So I called Era to catch up on things and asked for her help in the search for Demi. It had been a few days already, but neither Ira nor Beavis had heard anything about Demi. Feeling too restless, I went for a walk in the garden. Wait, what's that noise? Elden? See what you got yourself into, idiot. Told ya, I saw right through him. Why are you here? And what are you talking about? Ira already told me. Beavis obviously only sees you as someone else's replacement. He doesn't love you. Let's go home. No, let me go. Stop bothering my girl. Leave me alone, please. You're only making things worse. This place has everything and is much better than a hellhole in the middle of nowhere. Live there all you want. Don't drag me down with you. Eldon immediately let my hand go. He didn't say another word, but gave me a disappointed look. Was that too much? Well, he's the one who kept sticking his nose in others' business. Who is he to control me? After that day, I still saw him lurking around the mansion sometimes. So annoying. Who in their right mind would be out in this scorching heat? Today, Mom, I mean Mrs. Ashley, suddenly took me shopping. I guess having a family like this isn't too bad, huh? She said tonight I was attending an important dinner party, so I had to put on this tight dress along with a pair of killer heels. They looked pretty good, but I really couldn't breathe. Jeez, how can anyone do this? It's literally harder than walking on thin ice. Ah! Phew, that was close. Thank you, sir. I- Careful, I can't be around to protect you all the time. Alden, why is he still so kind to me? I wanted to say something to him, but Mom already signaled for me to hurry up from afar. I rushed to the car, leaving him there. Thanks to Mom's preparation, the guys there were staring at me without blinking, especially the special guest. Mom told me that I was supposed to be smiley and friendly to Otis, but how was I supposed to do that when he kept rambling all these boring stories? 
My eyes wandered around, searching for Beavis and an excuse to leave. What are you looking for, sweetie? The most important person is already right in front of you. Ugh! I pushed him away, then ran off. Ah, uh, there Beavis is. We should get out of this boring place. Oh, Mrs. Ashley's here too? What? That's it? I risk being in danger just to find her and bring her back to you. Don't take me for a fool. I'm only her stepmother, but I can tell that girl isn't Demi. I just let you off since she resembled her quite a bit. You're in no position to demand. But didn't you get Otis all smitten also? Isn't that all you care about anyway? So give me my money. I had to rack my brain to sweet talk that girl into coming here. That means your sickly mother doesn't exist either, does she? Oh, sweet, you've heard it all. So what if that's true? You won't get a dime. I'll expose your scheme. Where are you going, sweetheart? It's bedtime. So my phone was confiscated and I'd been locked in this room for three days straight. They wanted me to give in and date Otis, but no way. I tried every possible way to escape, but always ended up getting caught. One morning, I was woken up by dogs barking. Annoyed, I went to the balcony to check and saw Eldon and Bam. Eldon signaled for me to stay calm and flew a paper plane to me, then swiftly left. Let's see. <gasps> Fine then, if that's what he wants. Let's end things here once and for all. I agreed to date Otis like the Ashleys demanded. I even enthusiastically chose my own outfit, did my makeup with a cute hairstyle. Mr. and Mrs. Ashley were very pleased with that. They couldn't hide their excitement and even stood at the gate to welcome Otis when he came to pick me up. As his supercar arrived, Otis the preppy guy had just stepped out when Eldon signaled Bam to charge at him and scared him away. Meanwhile, the Ashleys were screaming for security. I was gonna leave in the midst of the chaos, but... Don't you dare run away! Ugh! Holly jumped out of nowhere and made Beavis fall to his knees. Holly then bit on his pants and dragged him around. Good job, baby! Right then, a car stopped in front of us and a girl stepped out who looked just like me. <gasps> this must be Demi! Who are you? Why do you look exactly like my daughter? What kind of father are you to not recognize your own child? This is precisely why I ran away from home. After that, Demi exposed her stepmother and Beavis' evil plan in my stead. Demi's dad frantically apologized to his daughter and admitted that he'd always been so caught up with work that he overlooked family and his wife's scheme. Get out of my sight at once, and don't even think about bringing a dime with you. Then Eldon dragged me into the car, and in the driver's seat was... Era! Thank you, Era. Just me? Eldon did most of it. I shyly looked over at Eldon. Thank you, and... I'm sorry. It's okay. We're friends after all. I'll take care of you at all costs. Um, uh, anyway, just hope that you've learned your lesson now, Brunna. Not all that glitters is gold. Eldon's right. This beautiful city is glamorous, but I don't belong here. I belong to the wind and snow, to the winterland I call home. Time to go back. The trip to the city was like a fever dream, but let's leave it all behind, cause I'm busy racing with Eldon. As expected, he's always as slow as a turtle. Hi, this is for you. For me? What's the occasion? The day we stop being friends. Brenna, what do you say if we become more than friends? Hey there, animated story show viewers. I'm Crystal, a model and influencer, and I'm here for the Trend Like This Influencer Awards. Why don't you come on in and get ready with me? I know what you're thinking. I have a unique look. You see, I have vitiligo, a condition that causes pale patches to develop on my skin. It's definitely different, but I don't really see it as a disadvantage, but rather one of my biggest perks in life. Since I was a kid, people have always gawped at me in the street. But luckily, my mom and big sis have always been there to support me. Honey, they're only looking at you that way because you're beautifully different. Yeah, Crystal, never doubt yourself. You're one of a kind. Thanks to them, I've grown to adore the way I look. Then one time, while we were walking in the park, this eccentric-looking man approached me. Oh my word, your skin! It's a masterpiece! Turns out, he was Beau Ivanov, the world-renowned photographer. He begged me to model for him, and with the encouragement of my mom and sis, I agreed, and my photos became a viral hit. That's when my interest in modeling sparked. I joined this awesome modeling agent and got to learn all poses for photo shoots, wear these gorgeous outfits, and best of all, have makeup done to complement my vitiligo, not to hide it. Ever since then, I've worked my butt off, fully committed to my work. That's how I became the face of multiple fashion brands and built up my influence empire. I wanted to pave the way for people like me to love themselves and celebrate our own uniqueness. Cause look at me, my career, my life could come to this point today, all thanks to my skin. And I wouldn't change it for the world. But then this morning came, I woke up to see, 
Yeah! My vitiligo patches, they were gone! This can't be happening! I still have tons of fashion shows and events booked for the rest of the year. Without my patches, will they all cancel on me? Panicked, I called my manager, Alex, and she immediately rushed into my apartment. This shouldn't have happened. The project with Red Rush is next week. I know that. What can I do? Go see a dermatologist? No, Crystal. You can't breathe a word about this to anyone. You don't want to ruin your career, do you? Well, no, but I can't hide inside forever. No, you can't. But you can fake your patches. Just use makeup. Draw some on. What? You mean I should lie to everyone? Your choice. It's either that or kiss goodbye to your career. This is wrong, I know, but I've worked so hard for this. I couldn't just give up now. I guess the foundation would have to make do. I went back to my daily modeling life, and luckily no one seemed to suspect anything. But I was so on edge and constantly checking my makeup. Crystal, have you heard? The brand Raris is looking for models with unconventional features for its newest fashion collection. You're the perfect fit! OMG! Everyone who's anyone in fashion knew of the Raris' creator, Mr. Finnegan. If I become his muse, that's my step into high fashion world! I can't miss this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity! I got my focus straight, fearlessly walking into the building, when suddenly my heel got stuck. I tumbled backward, and out of nowhere, these strong arms wrapped around me, and I landed straight into their warm embrace. For a moment there, I could feel their divine scent overpowering me. Hmm, Dior Sauvage, isn't it? You don't change much, do you? Still clumsy, even though you're now a superstar. Hold up. This voice. It's Sam, my high school ride or die. My, my, puberty has hit him hard, huh? Samuel knelt down and gently put the heel back on my foot. Yep, my heart was definitely flipping out of my chest. You're going in for the casting, right? Oh, um, yes. But how do you know? I'm one of the judges. I gotta go now. Break a leg. Uh, but not literally. Wow, Samuel's made a name for himself already. Impressive. Wait, Crystal, you're here for work. And now time to shine. I strutted my way along the catwalk, doing my signature twist-turn pose at the end of it. As expected, all the judges were mesmerized. This job was in the bag. Just then, everyone went ooh and awe at the girl next in line. It's Amanda! She's known as the super rookie, who challenges the modeling world's standards. Ironically, that title once belonged to me, but that's how this industry works. You can easily be dismissed if not careful. We got the results right after the casting. As expected, I was in for the show. Hooray! Hey, Crystal, right? Amanda, huge fan of yours. Say, can a pro like you give this rookie any advice while we train together? You do know this is a competition, right? That means no help. Then I shimmied off. Day one of the training, and I already messed up. I had to disguise myself to sneak out and buy a new one. Crisis averted, but this did make me 30 minutes late. You're the professional. Act like one so us amateur can look up to. A veteran in modeling. Or so they say. Those chicks wouldn't miss the chance to dethrone me. Especially her. Welcome, everyone. May I introduce you to our fall 2023 haute couture collection. It is inspired by the elegant art of ballet. So besides your usual training, you'll have a chance to learn some of the moves to capture its true essence. Then I'll pick my star, my vedette. Ballet? I hadn't done that since the accident. Little six-year-old me was having a ballet performance and had to do this crazy spinning technique. But somehow, I ended up twirling like a humming top, then face-planted right on the stage. I never forget the audience's mocking waves of laughter. No, get yourself together, Crystal. Whatever the challenge is, I'll succeed and rock the vedette position. The first lesson was catwalk. Easy peasy, no one came close to matching me. Good posture, excellent posing. Well done, Crystal. Aw, oh, he's so sweet. Can we just take a break to admire this piece of art? Come on, why are you so shy today, Crystal? Your patches are superb. <laughs> Except they're just the magic of makeup. But the nightmare had only just begun. Jeez, these clothes were way too tight. They got me melting like the witch from The Wizard of Oz. Gotta go touch up. Then during another session, I couldn't keep my balance and was wobblier than a jellyfish. Meanwhile, Amanda effortlessly executed all those moves. A few days later, Mr. Finnegan organized a photo shoot, which we had to pose like a ballerina on this revolving platform. The past trauma immediately rushed back into my head. I stepped onto the platform shaking like a leaf. Only with Samuel holding my hands could I imagine to do the simplest pose. At least it's over now. My, my, our pro seems a little rusty, doesn't she? Just step back and let one of us younger girls take care of this. Right, Amanda? Go practice, Xena.
Amanda stepped up to the platform. Her body started moving like a real swan. Gorgeous, Amanda. You're as graceful as the ballerina in the musical box. That's it. I think we got the shot. Well done. The whole set erupted in applause, and Amanda was the center of attention. Looks like you could learn a thing or two from your junior. Look, I may not be the best ballerina out there, but I'll show them where 1,000% efforts get me in life. So I stayed later after the training to practice more, starting with stretching. Ouch, not as easy as it looked. Okay, let's try again. Just have to raise my leg and... Whoa, whoa! Okay, this time it has to work. And now the hardest part, sur le point. Uh-oh. Just then, Samuel appeared, trying to catch me, but we both ended up stumbling on the floor. Don't try too hard. You may hurt yourself. It's just, the vedette means a lot to me. I know you can do it. You've been such a positive influence, and I know that energy can get you what you want. No, my patches. I, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to. It's okay. I crossed the line. I'll just leave now. Don't, please. If you only knew the truth, you wouldn't think so highly of me. Hey, what's wrong? You can talk to me, you know. Just then, the lights brightened around us. What are you two doing here at this hour? Samuel looked startled and immediately kept his distance from me. Nothing. I saw Crystal practicing. Thought I could give her some advice. That's not fair. I need some too. What do you think of my releve? They started laughing together like a married couple. Since when did they get so close? After a few days of intense practice, I may not be a ballet master yet, but I did feel more confident about facing the final challenge, which decided who would be the vedette. Look at this gorgeous couture design! I would make a perfect black swan. I tried the dress on, but accidentally smudged the foundation and got it all over the dress. Oh no! I immediately rushed to the bathroom trying to wash the stain off. Stupid foundation! Super stain my butt! The door suddenly snapped open and in stepped, Amanda! You, your vitiligo patches? They're coming off? And what are you doing with the dress? I tried to hide it, but she already snatched it away from me. Is it foundation stain? Did you fake your vitiligo? No, no, I was diagnosed with vitiligo for real, I, I swear. I told her the truth, thought she was going to use it against me, but to my surprise, she looked heartbroken. I decided to pursue modeling because I felt inspired by you, but now you're telling me it's all a scam? How could you? Amanda, wait, please. I... I thought you were against me. Does it matter anymore? Now that I got a taste of the truth, you don't deserve my respect. I was at an utter loss for words. I'd been so wrapped up in fear of losing my career that I couldn't care less how my action could affect those who looked up to me. I'm nothing more than a hypocrite. I couldn't live like this anymore. Fatiligo or not, I had to stay true to who I am. I walked straight up to the judges' panel and wiped all my foundation away right in front of them. Mr. Finnegan, I no longer fit in your collection. The truth is, my vitiligo has gone. I no longer have any unconventional features. Thus, I'm here to announce that I will cut myself from the show. I'm deeply sorry for all the trouble I caused. I turned to walk out the door, but there stood Samuel. Crystal, I don't understand. I'm sorry, Sam. I'm not the person you think I am. I ran home, hid under the blanket, and cried myself to sleep. Suddenly, a call from my manager woke me up. How can you sleep at this hour? The press is going wild. They're calling you an attention-seeking fraud. I immediately came to my senses and looked up the news. Oh no, how could it break out so fast? At this speed, I'd be canceled by tomorrow morning. See what happens when you act out of my order? Gosh, you models are so dumb. Don't go anywhere. I'll be there to handle this. Was she being for real? All of this was her idea in the first place. Enough! Have fun dealing with this on your own, Alex. I shut down my phone, packed my stuff, and left it all behind to go to my secret place. I used to spend time here with my family when I was a kid. Being surrounded by nature calms me down. Suddenly a hand pressed on my shoulder. Hey, we've been looking for you. Samuel? And Amanda? Did you guys follow me here? It's the only way we could find you. I'm sorry for going at you like that. I was so shocked. You don't have to. It's all my fault. I lost myself when my vitiligo went away. I acted out of fear and ended up disappointing everyone who's counting on me. <sighs> well, it's hard to stay sane when your identity is taken from you. But what's important is you've learned your lesson. Now, where is the fearless, confident crystal we all love? She's right. Patches or not, you're always special to us. That means a lot to me. Thanks, you guys. Turns out I'd misunderstood Amanda this whole time. She's brilliant, gorgeous, and caring, and perfect for Samuel. 
Welp, that stings. Suppose it's time I got back to work for some damage control. I opened the phone to see hundreds of notifications. Among them was a message from Mr. Finnegan, saying he has a place for me at the fashion show. So it's not the end for me, right? Go get it, girl. Yes, it felt so good to be back. Crystal, you're here. I have great news. You'll be the vedette for this collection. Me? But I don't have any unconventional features. Doesn't matter. You're perfect the way you are. Two girls will stand by your side, and you'll be in the center wearing this work of art. An elegant swan among the flock of ugly ducks. Isn't that a bit offensive? So this was your plan all along? Playing dirty tricks to save your flopped career? Cut it, Xena. Mocking me won't change the situation. There's something fishy going on here, and I'm gonna get to the end of it. Finally, the show has come. As soon as I got the signal, I strutted to the runway confidently, turning heads to my every step. But it's not for the reason you're thinking. I actually switched places with Amanda, and now all the spotlights are on her. Right at that moment, Mr. Finnegan bolted to the runway. What do you think you're doing? You ruined my show. I had a deal with her. I... What deal? Tell me. Right now. I... It's her who's behind this. Alex? Ugh, that snake! It turned out Alex bribed Mr. Finnegan to let me be the vedette and dragged the models with unconventional features down since I'm no longer one of them. Hearing that, all the models turned furious, ready to jump at the two frauds. You two have crossed the line. I don't need any of your manipulative games to continue my career. I will stay true to myself no matter what. Unconventional features or not, I'm always willing to speak up for them because everyone is beautiful in their own way and they deserve a chance to showcase their beauty to the world. The audience erupted in cheers and applause while Mr. Finnegan and Alex were surrounded by cameras and criticism. Justice served. After all that drama, I'm still modeling, but with a different agency that fully accepts me for the real me. I continued to influence young people on self-love and being uniquely themselves. Amanda and I became the best of friends. We also made tons of plans to collaborate with Samuel, but honestly, I couldn't shake off this heart-wrenching feeling whenever these two were together. Luckily, my hectic schedule has left me no time to think about that. Guess what? After days and nights of hard work, I now have my own line of skincare products called Only You. Exciting, right? Oh, Sam, you made it. Wow, they're beautiful. Amanda will love them. Uh, no, they're not for Amanda. They're for you. Crystal, I... I'm crazy about you. I always have been. What? It's me you like all along? Then why didn't you tell me that before, silly? I leaped into his arms, and we shared the most amazing kiss. Perfect ending for an amazing journey, huh? Not every day a girl outside the aerospace community like me could attend this creative science festival thingy, but here I was, all thanks to my genius boyfriend Mike, who just got accepted into MIT's aerospace engineering program. This is all really interesting. So great that Mike brought me here. Hey, you ruined my project. Who are you? Sorry, I, I'm Mike's, Mike? I can't believe he's talking to another girl when his girlfriend is in trouble here. The girl followed Mike and immediately fixed the model I just broke. Such an unfortunate brain behind her flashy clothes. Shh, keep it down. She's Mike's girlfriend. Really? Our valedictorian is into airheads? Huh? I thought Mike and Liana were a thing. Liana, the pretty girl who just fixed a freaking spacecraft model in a split second is being paired with my boyfriend? I'm Chloe, by the way. Sorry, I didn't introduce myself sooner. I just, ugh, never felt so self-conscious before. Mike and I have been together since high school. Back then, I was popular and had many boys chasing me. Everyone seemed amazed that a girl like me was with a nerd like him. But now, Mike's already an intern at NASA despite being only a freshman. Looks like he's a celebrity among his peers. And I was just his brainless girlfriend. For the first time ever, I felt like I had no place being such an elite student's girlfriend. I couldn't stop thinking about what happened at the science festival, so I decided to talk about it in my talk show, Bubble Buzz. Although I didn't show my face, I had heaps of listeners and every time the show was on, they flooded my comments section with excitement. Welcome back, my friends. So today's topic is, can a person's heart change when they go to college? I have a friend, Sally. She's been with her boyfriend for two years, 10 months and 21 days. But now he's gone to college in another state, living among new friends and new girls. Should she be worried that she'll become old news? Obviously, out of sight, out of mind, your friend should dump him before he does. No matter how good a relationship is, it can't escape the three-year curse. 
The three-year thing is real. All high school romances are doomed in the real world. Mike and I had been together for almost three years. Was this three-year curse really hitting us? Every comment seemed to believe it, while user Twinkle Star seemed to think this whole curse was silly. Curses don't exist. Relationships aren't easy. Both partners have to be willing to make an effort in their long-term relationship. Two years or ten years, it's irrelevant. Why does someone as serious as Twinkle Star listen to my show anyway? Since my early days hosting the show, this person always comments with confusing and boring quotes. I'm sure the curse was not a silly thing at all. Whether it was my three-year friendship with my first best friend Ella, or my parents divorcing after three years of marriage, the three-year milestone was real. Actually, I do know one couple who beat the curse. They're my grandparents. Grandpa's rather a cold and reserved person who only had eyes for his wife. So I asked Grandma what the secret to their successful relationship was. First, be grateful for your partner and not take love for granted. Second, know him better than you know yourself. Third, learn to forgive and apologize. Was that it? That wasn't exactly helpful. Our relationship was in a life-or-death situation, and I needed to really do something. Right that moment, someone appeared in the kitchen, and I couldn't believe it. My sister Mindy. I hadn't seen her in ages since she moved out with Dad. I explained my fears to Mindy, and she seemed to understand exactly why I was so concerned. Don't worry, sis. I'll stay here for a while so I can help you two overcome this curse and reignite your passion. First of all, as Mike's the biggest nerd I know, you need to appear more academic. Taking Mindy's advice, I gave myself this academia aesthetic, then went to see Mike at the amusement park. Oh, look, there he is. Huh? Chloe? Um, you look different. Since when did you wear glasses? I've, um, always worn them, Mike. You must not have noticed. I stayed up late last night to watch a physics documentary. Now it's time to impress Mike with my knowledge about how water fountains actually work without electricity and run solely on gravity. How the fat in ice cream impacts the freezing point, and I could taste the fat droplets. And how g-force and inertia were taken into account when mechanics made roller coasters for the thrill. But he didn't seem impressed at all. Chloe, you're not yourself today. Are you okay? I'm not okay. I've been wiggling my foot at you for ages, but you never noticed my undone laces. You didn't let me try your ice cream first, as you always do, and you didn't notice the effort I put into learning all this sciencey stuff for you. I'm sorry. I have this big project on my mind, and... Mike Jenkins, you've changed. The Mike I know and love was attentive and wouldn't let me walk around with untied shoes. You don't love me anymore. It all got too much for me, so I hurried off. Well, as quickly as I could with my shoelaces flailing. As soon as I got home, I phoned Mindy and told her everything. I was so lucky to have my big sis. OMG, he did what? It sounds like he just doesn't care about you anymore. Do you think? Um, maybe... Maybe he was just... No. If he cared, he would have come after you. Instead, he let you walk on dangerous sneakers. Mindy was right. Mike grew cold on me. This three-year curse was real. Now what should I do? There's only one thing. You'll have to test him. I've been sitting here for the past hour and Mike hasn't... Here he comes. This was Mindy's idea. Faking a car malfunction and calling Mike for help. Wow, you're so good. I'd still be stranded here alone without you. You could have asked someone else or called a garage. There wasn't even anything wrong with... It doesn't matter. But you're my boyfriend. Yes, your very busy boyfriend who lives in a different state. Anyway, I got a dash, and we'll have to take a rain check on next week. I have a lot on my plate. Then Mike left, leaving me more afraid of losing him than ever. As if he just left. His new environment changed him even more than I thought. Chloe, you have to infiltrate his space now before you lose him forever. So I went sneaking into Mike's dorm room and transformed it from nerdy to romantic chic. I hear footsteps. I better hide. I can't wait for him to see it. There's Mike, but, huh? Who's with him? Oh, wow. Romantic much? Then the other person started taking their clothes off. I leaped out of the closet ready to tackle this man-stealer to the ground, but hold on a second. That's actually a man. Mike's roommate, Gus? Chloe, um, what are you doing here? I'm sorry. I just wanted to surprise you and, and ask you to come on a date with me today, tomorrow, whenever you're free. I told you I'm busy this week. I have an inspection tomorrow. So, you mean I'm bothering you? You don't need me anymore? Here, you can use my ID card and go with Mike to the inspection. Make it a hot date. That's very kind of you. Thank you so much. One way or another, my infiltration mission was a success. Hehe. <laughs>
The next day, I came to this technical area with Mike and just stuck to him, not knowing what else I was supposed to do. Chloe, don't touch anything, okay? Mike, there you are. You have to come and see this. She dragged him off, and did she just smirk at me? Ugh, what an awful pick-me girl. She was obviously trying to separate us. No way was I gonna let her get away with that. I'd show them all that I deserve to be with him. While Liana's by herself walking around with a VR headset, I came to tell her to keep her hands off my boyfriend. Oh, there you are. Stay away from Mike. Little do you know that he has a girlfriend. You're just a clingy airhead that he's too polite to break up with. I'm the perfect girl for him, not you. I, I'm the most influential radio host on social media, and a third wheel like you call me an airhead? I'll make sure everyone knows what a horrible person you are. Really, so scary. As if I'll be worried about those pathetic gossip girls. How dare she? I pushed her, and suddenly, smash. Her headset broke into pieces on the floor. Oh no, Mike told me not to touch anything. What are you doing here? What happened? I'm so sorry, Chloe. I know that you're not okay with this whole thing, but I'm Mike's teammate and we have to interact a lot. Nothing is going on between us. You're overreacting. Then she ran away in tears like she wasn't at fault. She's lying. I didn't say that. She said she wants. Chloe, enough. I'm too busy to worry about what chaos you're going to cause next. I think we should take a break. He took the ID pass off me, leaving me feeling like my whole world had crumbled. After crying an ocean of tears, I decided to make this right. I threw away my ego and texted him first. But before I hit send, I received a message from Mike saying he was sorry and we would have a trip to celebrate our three-year anniversary. This meant we weren't over and the curse wasn't true. Ooh, I needed to figure out which outfits to bring. I got everything packed and ready for our vacation of a lifetime. It was gonna be so romantic. But all of a sudden, Liana rushed to us and flung her arms around Mike. My pet dog, Nova, she's, she's passed away. I can't be alone right now. I'd rather die. That lying party pooper. Poor Mike didn't know what to say, so she just jumped in the back seat without my permission. No problem. The more, the merrier. I'll invite my sister to join us too. Mindy proved to be super useful, always interjecting whenever Liana approached Mike. But Liana just became more and more shameless. She glued herself to Mike and had the audacity to lie down next to him like I was invisible and even ate his ice cream. Worse still, my oblivious boyfriend didn't seem bothered at all. She's more cunning than I thought. You need to step up your game. It was such a beautiful night, but that third wheel Liana was buzzing around Mike like a mosquito. Then she started talking about physics stuff, and now he's so caught up in their conversation, I may as well have disappeared. Hmm, how could I make Liana see Mike loves me, not her? Well, I wasn't sure if he loves me anymore. Chloe, 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 you long for attention so badly you're willing to hurt yourself. She's already hurt because of you. This is her special three-year anniversary, and you invited yourself like how you've always wormed your way in. I bet you don't even have a dog. I diverted my gaze from a fake crying Liana to a confused-looking Mike. Chloe, what are you trying to do? I'm worried you've lost your passion for me because we're at the three-year mark. We have different interests, and I can't help but feel insecure about us. If you keep acting like this... Well, I just don't know. I've been thinking about our future, too, and I've decided it's time for us to... Oh, no, no, no! This isn't happening! I think I'm pregnant! We got back two days ago, and Mike still hadn't contacted me. This curse had caught up with me, and I lost him for good. I just wish I hadn't lied about the baby. Then maybe our breakup wouldn't have been so awkward. This called for retail therapy. I stepped outside and saw Mike with a massive suitcase. Chloe, I've abandoned the project and dropped out of college. I'm going to take care of you, both of you. Mike scurried around the house to make it pregnant woman friendly. He threw out all junk food, coffee, and even mayonnaise. Also, my high heels were packed away and Mozart was played everywhere in the house. Apparently, it'll make the baby a genius. We were going to have the perfect, happy family life. But when I went to my room to get my laptop for my next radio show, I couldn't find it anywhere. I asked Mike and he said, I packed it up with your high heels, makeup, books, and put them all in storage. You don't need any distractions. Just me, you, and the baby from now on. No more radio, studying, or friends. We can have a bunch of kids and grow old in this house. What? This wasn't what I wanted. Neither of us should have boring, unfulfilling lives or give up our dreams, right? I might not have my laptop, but I still had my phone. 
Welcome back. Today's topic is my friend Sally again. She lied about being pregnant so her boyfriend wouldn't leave her. Should she keep lying or tell the truth? This time, Twinkle Star appeared again. I know she's always been a brave girl who isn't afraid of admitting her own faults and correcting her mistakes. She should tell her boyfriend the truth and explain how much she loves him. Hmm, sounds oddly specific. Who's this person? Actually, Bubble Buzz, we know each other. Before I could ask him anything else, Twinkle Star went offline. Whoever that was, I think they were right. So I went downstairs to talk to Mike, only he wasn't there. Instead, Mindy jumped out of nowhere holding a pregnancy test and a bottle of Coke. I just need to dunk this in here and the plus sign will show up clear as day in case Mike has any doubt about the baby. No need to. I'm going to tell him the truth. Are you sure about that? What if Mike gets mad? I stopped and thought about it. No, as scary as it was, I couldn't do this anymore. I was looking out for Mike by telling him the truth. Where was he? He had to be around here somewhere. Liana, why was she here with Mike? Mike, I'm sorry, but Chloe's not pregnant. She admitted on her radio show. You deserve to be with someone who wouldn't make up such awful lies. Someone like me. Oh no, I lost the chance to tell him firsthand. Now Mike would never talk to me ever again. Chloe, wait. I couldn't turn around and bear the disappointment in his eyes. I couldn't blame anyone, any third wheel or curse for destroying my relationship. Hey there, I know this is an unscheduled show, but I wanted to talk to y'all. That girl I talked about yesterday, Sally, well, she's me. I faked being pregnant to keep my relationship, but my boyfriend hates me now. I was so terrified of this three-year curse that I became this jealous monster. Mike even dropped out because of me. I'm so selfish for expecting him to spend every minute of his day with me. He needs his own life too. We both do. It's the time apart that makes our time together more exciting. And our love more passionate. Now we've broken up and it's all my fault. I stopped to catch my breath. Who told you I wanted to break up? Didn't, didn't you say you thought carefully about our future and made a decision? You know what? After all your silly shenanigans, including faking your pregnancy, I'm still madly in love with you. So the decision I made was, Chloe Ruth Evanson, you're crazy, kooky, and one of a kind. I can't stand the thought of not having you in my life. Will you marry me? Yes! But, Mike, after our engagement, you should continue your studies, projects, internship and whatnot. You don't have to stay by my side all the time. What? I thought you'd like that. We can be together all day and make enough babies for a soccer team, right? Relax, I'm just kidding. I knew you were lying about the baby all along. Your grandpa told me. Turns out, Twinkle Star was none other than my grandpa, who saw that I needed some guidance and tried to give me objective advice. Mike only went along with the lie to tease me. Hmm, who knew my nerdy boyfriend could be so playful? Or should I say, my fiancé? Hi, my name is Danielle, Danny for short, and this is not exactly a good time. Smile, Danny. Don't make us feel bad. Yeah, I'm so happy to be sent away out of your sight. Don't get us wrong, darling. You're gonna love this school, right, honey? Yes, it's a prestigious school for children of affluent families. Your mother and I loved our time at Kingsbury as well. Because it was perfect for you. Trust me, I'm nothing like you. But one day you'll thank us for keeping you off the streets. It's always that condescending tone. As much as I hated being stuck at some age-old boarding school, I could use some time away from my parents. Before I go on, I should mention how this happened. Simple. I saw a big tough guy pushing around my friend, so I slashed his car tires in front of him to teach him a lesson. But to my parents, that was a rebellious act, so they're sending me to some boarding school as punishment. As we pulled up to Kingsbury's gates, I momentarily forgot how much I didn't want to be there. The medieval castle towers disappearing into the clouds could be mistaken for Hogwarts. I actually felt a string of hope for my future here. Unfortunately, those hopeful thoughts were short-lived. The principal, Mr. Hooper, had already read through my file and made up his mind about me. Rest assured, we have a reputation for our discipline for a reason, and students like Danielle here benefit the most from it. Clearly not the fresh start I had imagined. Mrs. Bell led me down the hall, then stopped at the door to room 237. A girl answered. Hi, Rumi. I'm Cassandra. You can call me Cass. Welcome to Kingsbury. Danny. You'll be under Cassandra's supervision outside school hours. She's a model student who has been here long enough to know that there is no way around our rules. Of course they'd make the teacher's pet babysit me. Awesome. Cass was worse than I thought. She constantly used looking for things as an excuse to touch my stuff. Surely she snooped around when I wasn't here, too. 
so I figured I could have a little fun. I'd give this nosy roommate something to poke her nose into. This looks like an ordinary diary, but on the inside, I wrote about how I'd bring a vodka-filled water bottle to class, put bedbugs in Cass's bed, and sell cheat sheets to other students. You know, fun stuff. I definitely wouldn't do any of that, but gotta give our audience some drama, right? <laughs> and the next day, Cass's behavior confirmed she had really read it. Is everything okay, Cass? What? Everything's fine. Just thought it was time to wash the sheets. Don't mind me. Sure, girl. I believe you. At Kingsbury, there were rules for just about everything. I managed to break half of them within my first two weeks just by existing, it seemed. Worse still, the punishments hardly ever match the crimes. I once had to reshelve hundreds of books for missing the 8 p.m. curfew just because I was studying in the library. Another time, I had to clean the dining hall for an entire week because my shirt was untucked for a second. Not to mention, Mrs. Bell seemed to have eyes out for everything, everywhere, all at once. What in the world? How was I supposed to know Teen Vogue was considered contraband here? And that was punishable by cleaning every single candle holder in the school church. Could this school be any more constricting? Do they really expect us to entertain ourselves by laughing at the clouds like we're patients in an asylum? Or what? With literally zero fun, no wonder why everyone here always looks like zombies. I hear you're the new school rebel, Danielle Wright. I'm Caroline. What do you say we blow this pop school stand and go have some real fun? No thanks, I've had enough trouble already. It's fine, come on. Hey, you, finish this up, won't you? The audacity of this chick, though. Um, how about no? You can't boss people around like that. Drop that self-righteous act already. No need to pretend you care about dorks. I'm good, and he's not the dork here. Ugh, I thought you were cool. What was that about? That boy thanked me, introduced himself as Ian, and asked what trivial fault I must have made to be stuck with this boring chore. So we chatted and made fun of Kingsbury's rules while I finished up. I felt like I was finally seen after those awful first weeks. Suddenly, things didn't feel so bad anymore. However, Caroline already set out to make my life miserable. This morning, she blocked me in the hallway right before the bell rang, which got me in trouble for being late and running. If she wasn't getting me in trouble, she was trying to humiliate me. And annoyingly, it worked. As much as I wanted to do something about it, I knew that any sort of retaliation would get me in more trouble. The only peaceful moments I had were with Ian. How come I never knew about these cool areas before? This is the entertainment room in the home theater system, and out there is our Olympic-sized swimming pool and the croquet field. Pretty cool, right? But we're almost never allowed to use them. Sometimes I think these are here just to impress parents. This place is unbelievable. All work and no play? Is this a prison? And still, I had a nosy roommate to deal with. To keep up the ruse, I wrote some more made-up shenanigans in my dummy diary. Ridiculous rules, Caroline's antics, and how passionately I hated Kingsbury made their way into the diary as well. We we're trapped on campus and anything fun was against the rules. It felt like we we're here to be reprogrammed into obedient robots our parents wish we were. But at least Ian's cool. The next day, Cass kept trying to strike up a conversation with me. Hey, Rumi. Everything good with you? Define everything. Like, how are you liking Kingsbury? Is anyone giving you trouble or anything? Should I be having problems? No, no, I hope not. I just thought you seemed a little down. As your Rumi, I wanted you to know that I'm here for you, if you need a friend. Oh, she must have read my diary again. But honestly, I found her clumsy cover-up quite endearing. Then she tried to change the subject to Caroline, who turned out to be her ex, Rumi. I know she's mean, but she wasn't always that way. She only changed after a big trouble that almost got her kicked out. Wow, what could she have possibly done? Cass said Caroline then soon moved to another room also. I can't help but feel bad for her, though. She was actually kind to me. Cass seemed genuinely nice, but I wanted to see if she could be honest. If you're really my friend, then tell me, did you read my diary? You know? But hear me out. Your parents paid me to keep an eye on you and report everything to them. I agreed because I thought I was helping you stay on track. But Cass said she soon realized I wasn't really doing those bad deeds, so she actually told my parents good things only. I promise I've stopped working for them. It was wrong of them to spy on you, but I was in the wrong too. I'm sorry, can you forgive me? I believed her, but it wouldn't hurt to use this newfound friendship for some good. So I asked Cass to propose a fun activity for the upcoming holiday season to lighten up this lifeless place. Teachers, listen to you, and we'll donate the money to a good cause. You love this place, don't you? 
help make everyone else love it too. Sounds great. Let's do it. Thanks to Cass, our Christmas market came to life. I'd never seen so many smiling faces at Kingsbury. I even managed to secure some last-minute entertainment. Surprisingly, Ian volunteered to perform, and he's really good. He usually wasn't one to stand out, but that night, things changed. Maybe it was the Christmas lights or the Ed Sheeran effect was making Ian everyone's crush, including mine. Not only did we have a blast, but also raised thousands of dollars to donate to a local hospital. A few days after that, we saw Caroline being flirty towards Ian. Of course Caroline would try to sink her teeth into Ian now that she knew he's hot. Luckily, Ian didn't seem interested. What you looking at? Just you, making an absolute fool of yourself. How dare you? Thanks, Cass. She really wasn't taking the hint. That moment, I knew I'd found my people. The next day, while I was concentrating on my math exam, Caroline suddenly showed me something. I'm so sorry. Let's be friends. She wants to make up? Now? Mrs. Harris, she's copying me. What in the world? This shameless liar. I was preparing for the worst when Mrs. Harris said, What's this, Caroline? Her answers are nothing like yours. Not like Danielle needs to cheat off of you. She then gave me back my sheet and dismissed Caroline's. I could see she was still in shock when she walked out. Incredible! Mrs. Harris totally saw through her act. Mrs. Harris was unlike any other teacher at Kingsbury. She was firm, but kind. With her on my side, Caroline didn't bother me anymore. I felt safe confiding in an adult like her. We eventually became more like friends. You like Ian, don't you? I can tell just by looking. There's a carnival in town tomorrow night. That's your chance to make a move. But, Mrs. Harris, curfew. Okay, it didn't sound like a good idea, but I did want to go on a date with Ian, so I texted him and he immediately said yes. Mrs. Harris basically told me to go for it. What could go wrong? I tried to quietly leave, but as I stepped into the hallway, Mrs. Bell's flashlight blinded me and boy was she mad. So mad that she dragged me straight to Mr. Hooper's office. This was the second time I came here, which was a lot sooner than I expected. I knew from the start that you would be a problem, Miss Osborne. You have violated the rules time and time again and display a blatant disregard for authority. Sir, aside from tonight, I never intended to break any rule. I promise I've learned from those mistakes and won't be repeating them. They weren't minor offenses, Miss Osborne. Drinking, distributing cheat sheets, infesting your roommate's bed with bugs. Those were what I wrote in the dummy diary. How? We do not allow such delinquency here. In fact, you should be expelled at this very moment. However, out of respect for your parents, you may leave quietly by your own volition. I tried to explain myself, so he gave me three days to come up with evidence in the end. When I got back, I saw my desk drawer ajar, and Cass was asleep. She wouldn't do this. We're friends. But who else? My phone suddenly rang. It's Ian. I didn't want to talk about this over the phone, so I simply explained that someone didn't want me here and promised we'd talk later. I don't want you out either, bestie. Neither do I, Cassie. Not to waste any time, I came up with a plan to sniff out the culprit. This time, I wrote that I was playing a prank on Mrs. Bell. I even set up a silent alarm system with this piece of paper to see if anyone had opened my drawer. The next day, lo and behold, the alarm worked like a charm. They must have taken the bait. Now all there's left to do was... I opened the door to see someone totally unexpected. Now that my plan set in motion, Ian and I hid behind a wall near Mrs. Bell's office. This is an interesting first date. Romantic, isn't it? We suddenly heard footsteps approaching. I peeked around the corner to see Mrs. Harris. I instantly felt my blood boiling. The one person who I trusted betrayed me. I was about to confront her when Ian pulled me back and put one hand over my mouth. Mrs. Harris looked around impatiently, then tried to open the door. As the hinges creaked open, Ian played a loud alarm. Startled, Mrs. Harris tripped and fell. Then Mrs. Bell sprinted towards us. <sighs> What's going on? I arrived just in time to catch these two sneaking around your office. They're playing a prank on you. Are you sure? Because that's not what the camera saw. She's lying. She wrote all about it in her diary. I'm here to catch her in the act. Mrs. Harris, how do you know what I write in my personal diary? I was just messing with my roommate. Are you trying to use them against me? Don't believe a word, she says. She's delinquent. Why would she write about sneaking in alcohol if she wasn't thinking of doing it? It's only a matter of time. So you just make up something if nothing happens, Mrs. Harris? Caroline appeared alongside Mr. Hooper. Mrs. Harris's face turned white at their sight. Caroline then said she accidentally overheard Mrs. Harris tell me to go out after curfew, which was shocking because she'd heard the same before. 
That's how Caroline was disciplined while her boyfriend was expelled. Recognizing the pattern in Mrs. Harris's behavior, she came to me. We decided to work together to stop this once and for all. Do you care to explain yourself? You really believe these rascals? They just want to make me look bad. That's not me in that video. It's deep fake. By that point, many students had gathered around us. They all came forward to share similar stories about Mrs. Harris. She gained their trust and persuaded them to break school rules. When they're on the verge of expulsion, she blackmailed their parents into paying her lots of money to keep them here. At this point, Mrs. Harris had to relent and admitted her wrongdoings. Mr. Hooper summoned me to his office the following day. Miss Osborne, I apologize for misjudging you. I am aghast to learn what Mrs. Harris was doing right under my nose. I may have never known it if it wasn't for yesterday's incident, so thank you. I assure you I'll do whatever it takes to fix the damages she caused. Sir, I don't think Mrs. Harris was the root of the problem. It's Kingsbury's harsh rules. I know you take great pride in them, but rigidity isn't helping. Obedient kids become soft and submissive, while strong-willed ones end up challenging authority. Mrs. Harris took advantage of that. Most students here are exceptional, but their creativity is getting crushed under iron discipline. Mr. Hooper patiently listened to me. In the end, he shook my hand and bid me farewell. A week later, we received an email titled, A Message from the Principal. It contained a video of Mr. Hooper giving a formal apology to the students and families who were victimized by Mrs. Harris, who won't be teaching at any school again. He also acknowledged the problems plaguing our school. Going forward, we will be installing council-based solutions to handle students' problems. Several harsh punishments will be abolished, and mental health services will be available to all. In addition, extracurricular activities will be encouraged. Things really changed for the better. Liveliness had returned to these beautiful hallways. Caroline stopped acting out and started patching things up with her old friend Cass. Now that the dust has settled, I think I'm in love with Kingsbury. And someone too. We're finally going on our long-awaited date. Finally, back in my natural habitat. Now these city kids could see what I'm capable of. Behold, my big, beautiful flame. They were in awe of my skill. When suddenly, the fun was put to an end by some overreacting teachers. They started yelling at me, saying there's a rule against fire. Ugh, how could you call this a campsite if campfire is not even allowed? Fire making is an essential survival skill, y'all. These boring city people don't know a thing. Who needs all their rules anyway? I know I don't. Hi, I'm Nova, the fire hazard. And I didn't always live in the city. I spent the first 14 years of my life on the road. Our family used to travel the country in our RV. We never stayed any place more than a couple of months. We foraged for food and slept under the stars. But my world was flipped upside down when my parents decided to divorce. My mom wanted to settle down and my dad would continue life on the road. I begged to go with dad, but mom had custody of me. I'd love to stay with you, my little birdie, but I have to go. No cage can hold me for too long. At that moment, I promised myself I would break free and spread my wings too. My mom and I then settled into a small two-bedroom apartment in Savannah, Georgia, where we were greeted by our neighbors, Brenda Foster, a middle school teacher, and her son, Scott, who I'd soon be attending school with. Mrs. Foster was really friendly, but from the moment I met Scott, I knew we wouldn't get along. City people were always grumpy and glued to their cell phones. Mom had to work two jobs just to make ends meet. Accountant by day, Burger King employee by night. Her colorful wardrobe was replaced with dull uniforms, and all we ate now was fast food. I still kept a sheer hope that one day, when Mom makes enough money, we will hit the road again soon, but... No, this is going to be our forever home. Things might be hard for you at first, but trust me, it'll be good for you in the long run. That sounds like she wants my life to be this boring and stuffy for all eternity. Then came school. There were tons of rules, and every moment of our day was scheduled. In just one morning, I got in trouble for going to the bathroom and for eating my lunch. And on top of that, every teacher complained about my penmanship and spelling. But things were worse when I was among other kids. I could hear their whispers everywhere I went. One girl even came up to me and asked why I wore weird hippie clothes. My clothes aren't weird. You are. Even when some of them invited me to sit with them at lunch, I felt like an outsider. Anyone down for some pink drinks after school? Not me. I'm saving up for the era's tour. Count me in. I'm entering my pink girl era. None of these words they say makes any sense to me. Finally, they asked about my old life. Well, we didn't have to eat this junk. We can get fresh vegetables by the road. And I know how to skin road kills. And every day we tried many different fruits and fungi. But be careful, a simple mushroom could kill you. 
but by that point, I noticed they were either speechless or as pale as a ghost. Did I say something wrong? Every school day was a blur of confusing subjects, but today was my first music lesson, and I was so excited to finally do something I was good at. When the music teacher, Mr. Shapiro, asked if anyone wanted to perform for the class, I sprung up from my seat, ready to go. I confidently sang my favorite song, but halfway through, Mr. Shapiro interrupted me. We're learning classical music. That style is called reggae, which we don't teach here. <laughs> Nova's a hippy-dippy weirdo. The whole class erupted into laughter. What did I do? Ugh! Scott! I was so gonna give him a taste of my rosewood guitar, but everyone held me back. In the end, Mr. Shapiro said he'd be talking with our moms after school. Scott and his mom had already left before my mom came. Mr. Shapiro told her that I was a violent hothead who always dressed inappropriately. I waited for my mom to defend me, but she simply apologized. I'll talk to her about this later. Please excuse her behavior. She has never been to school before. Who was this woman and what had she done to my mother? Later, I told my mom how terrible school was. The constant staring and teasing. The way that everyone seemed to be a little afraid of me. Contrary to my expectation, she told me I should try harder to blend in. And she even had bought me normal clothes for school. Mom, clothes are my self-expression. I'm not changing just to fit in. What happened to you? Didn't you teach me to be myself? I did, but now I need you to blend in so you can make friends. I... I had to leave before bursting into tears. I couldn't stay in the stuffy apartment any longer. So I went out the window, climbed down the fire escape, and just ran away. But at one point, I realized I didn't know where to go. So I wandered around until I bumped into the Fosters, who insisted on walking me back home. Strangely, Scott seemed less annoying now, and kept looking awkwardly at me the whole way home. My mom was clearly surprised to see me when she opened the door. I felt like a joke, because she hasn't even noticed my rebellious great escape. I couldn't sleep that night. After thinking it over, I came to the conclusion that I could get my old life back if I found my dad. If only I knew how. The next morning at school, I went looking for the tools I needed to find my dad. Compass, flashlight, map. Scott? What are you up to in there? You first. I wanted to apologize for what happened in music class yesterday your turn. I'm gathering what I need to go find my dad, and there's nothing you can do to stop me. Stop you? It looks like you need help. Those things may have helped you hundreds of years ago, but these days we just use the internet. I didn't want Scott's help, but maybe he was right. I had no clue where to start, and I could hardly even figure out how to use my cell phone. <sighs> maybe I need a little help to learn about the internet. Follow me. Scott spent that afternoon teaching me the basics of the internet. He also asked about my old life, and I found myself telling him everything. All the things I missed and hated about this new life. To my surprise, he was understanding. His mother was a single mom too, and it had been years since he heard from his father. After that day, I thought I hated him a bit less. About a week later, I felt like I was ready to start my search. Little did I know, googling my dad's name would give me literally millions of results. I was about to give up when I saw some people looking for their dogs. Hmm, that just gave me an idea. I printed as many flyers as the library would allow, and spent the next day putting them up around the neighborhood. I was surprised by a strange phone number. Hello? Yeah, hi. I just saw a clueless hippie wandering around, and I think they matched the description you provided. I was over the moon by how quick I got a response. But then I saw Scott, half a block away, grinning at me with a cell phone in his hand. That internet thing you taught me is useless. Finding people is not that fast, even with the internet. Your best bet would be the database at the police station. Are you sure you... I didn't need to hear any more words and immediately flagged down a police car passing by. Over here, officer! The officer pulled over and rolled down his window. Morning, sir. Please take us to the station. What are you kids doing? Where are your parents? Well, I'm looking for my dad. I heard the officer speak into his intercom, saying he was bringing a lost child back to the station. Well, that's not what I meant, but whatever does the job, I guess. As he led me into the back of the car, I remembered. Sir, he's with me. Should we bring him too? Correction, two lost kids. Scott was obviously stunned, as the police officer escorted us into his car. It's hilarious! <laughs> of course, I need my sidekick with me to help me find that database thingy. Shortly after arriving at the station, the officer left the room to get us some water. As soon as the door closed behind him, I sprung into action. I had to look in every corner, but Scott wasn't helping. Come help me. Where could that database thingy be in this room? What? No, dummy. It's in here. Then he jumped to the computer and did some clicking. Type your dad's name here. Keep an eye out. In an instant, a file with my dad's info came up. 
I printed it out and sprinted home before the ink could dry. My heart was pounding as I dialed my dad's number. Hey, yo. Dad, it's so good to hear your voice. Uh, who is this? It's me, Dad. Complete silence on the other end. Did I call the wrong number? It's me, Nova? Nova! Glad to hear from you. Guess what, kid? I've been up to all kinds of adventures. Then he talked to me about his amazing trips that I would have loved to be on. Then I asked where he was so I could go find him. I live in the moment, my little birdie. I go where the road takes me. Please, Dad, let me tag along. Okay, meet me at the exit of the interstate at 10 p.m. tomorrow. He ended the call before I could say anything else. I felt the sudden urge to cry for some reason. They must be happy tears. I was finally seeing my dad again. But how could I get there? Maybe my sidekick Scott could help me. If he had made it back from the police station. Oopsies! I ran to Scott's apartment, and to my surprise, he answered the door. Hey, how did you get home? Once I explained to the officer that you were just a little eccentric, he let me go. I'm sorry I left you there. I wasn't really thinking. Oh, I spoke to my dad, and he's picking me up tomorrow night. So, I need your help to get to the highway. The highway? What kind of parent asks his 14-year-old to meet him at the highway at night? Did he even ask you how you were doing? Or your mom? He clearly doesn't care at all. Wait, yeah, he really didn't ask. But dad probably was just busy. We can talk all about it tomorrow when we meet anyway. How dare Scott think ill of him? What do you know about my dad? He's a free spirit, and I should be traveling with him. Life's all about being spontaneous. My mom doesn't even understand it anymore, so I don't expect you to. But if you don't want to help me, fine. I'll figure it out myself. Then I stormed off. The night after, I was struggling with Google Maps. My phone was suddenly snatched out of my hand. I'll take you there. You might get lost if you go alone. I was still a little upset about yesterday, but that was nice of him. Plus, Scott was right. I would get lost on my own. We arrived early and waited. The hours dragged by, so I called Dad several times, but no answer. When I saw it was past 11 p.m., my call finally came through. Oh, man. You were there now? Our bus passed Savannah a while ago. <laughs> we're having a grand party. You should see. Oh, uh, well, maybe we'll cross paths again soon. Bye, little birdie. He hung up right away. I noticed Scott watched me for a reaction, but I couldn't hold it in and burst into tears. Scott got us on the bus to go home. I was sobbing the entire way and couldn't talk through all the tears. Eventually, Scott spoke up. When my parents divorced, I spent a lot of time being mad at my mom, too. I couldn't understand why she didn't make my dad stay. But she did try to, right? Nope. She just accepted it. And I eventually realized that she wasn't weak like I had thought. She chose to stay to make sure my life was normal. Leaving would have been easy. And what she did, keeping the lights on actually took a lot more strength. What Scott said sounded surprisingly mature. After that, we sat in silence for a while. I understood what Scott was saying, but I didn't think it applied to my case. My mom was just not the person she used to be. We arrived home very late. Before we parted, Scott said, Why don't you ask your mom why she decided to settle down here? Kids don't always understand why parents do certain things. Maybe you should hear her out. I nodded and took a deep breath before opening the door. My mom was on the phone with the cops, and as soon as she saw me, she ran to give me the biggest hug I had gotten in a long time. She asked me where I'd been, and I told her everything. How I tried to find Dad, how he stood me up, and things Scott said earlier. She listened to me attentively, then said what Dad did was terrible, but not exactly out of character. You know how we stopped by a town from time to time? Working temporary jobs like waiting tables and washing cars, right? What you didn't know is that your father always messed up and got fired a few days after he started. So he decided that he'd look after you while I worked. I didn't realize how hard mom had always been working while me and dad were just carelessly having fun. Then I asked why she chose that life in the first place. When I met him, I was working a 9-to-5 job that I hated. While your dad was all about, the world is a book, traveling makes you a storyteller. Of course, that sounded fascinating, so I quit my job and set myself free on the RV we bought. But why did you decide to settle down after all these years? After having you, I realized our wandering life wasn't a good environment for a kid. I was worried you'd have a hard time once you got older, especially because your dad wasn't being helpful and was only being a bad example for you. Besides, homeschooling is difficult. We aren't teachers. You deserve to grow up in a stable home, have friends your age, and create deep connections with them. I got you two, and... and people we met from all over the country. But not enough, honey. 
I thought I should give you a normal life while you're still young. You'll be better prepared to make your own decisions later as an adult. It was unfair to you. Because you didn't choose that life. We did. The resentment I had towards my mom melted away. In its place was a profound gratitude for all that she sacrificed. I wasn't good with words, so I told her that the best way I could. Do you miss our old life? Well, yes. But for now, you're my number one priority. After the hurt's gone, it was time to heal. I tried to focus on my lessons and learn the rules. My mom even helped me pick out clothes that were more appropriate for school, but still felt like me. I tried my best to enjoy the same movies as other kids and learned to play their favorite songs on my guitar. Soon enough, they became my new friends. I continued to grow even closer to Scott, my friend and partner in crime, from the start. Still, my mom and I agreed that we shouldn't totally abandon our love for travel, and she promised that we would plan a few big road trips every year, starting this summer. I can hardly wait for our trip to Niagara Falls with Mrs. Foster and Scott. It was the final match. My team, the Bulldogs, were neck on neck with our opponent, the Knights. Declan passed me the ball and I sprinted towards the goal, outrunning all the chasing Knights players. Suddenly, this guy cut me off and tackled me to the ground. I managed to break free, lunging towards the goal, and scored a triumphant touchdown. My teammates and I were celebrating when I saw the player who tackled me, Cody, talking to the ref and pointing at me? Suddenly, the ref blew his whistle. She's a girl, I could tell when I tackled her. She's a girl, so what? Why is a girl on a boys football team playing as a dude? She's not even registered properly. But she's the best player who scored more points than anybody on the Knights team, alone, and the winning goal. Despite Declan and my teammates standing up for me, the ref announced it was an unfair score and gave the win to the Knights. Hey, it's okay, Riley. We had a good game and a good season because you're here. Right, guys? Yeah, I'm okay, guys. That player, Cody, you, sir, have made an enemy for life. Hi, I'm Riley, a tomboy through and through. I prefer getting down and dirty on the football field rather than fussing over makeup and boys. Ironically, Nola, the girliest girl you know, is my best friend since childhood and also the only girlfriend I hang out with. But even then, sometimes Nola's feminine energy got out of control. Like today, when she's crying over some boy she was in a complicated relationship with. We've been together for a while when I saw him seeing another girl today. Yeah, things happen. I swear we locked eyes and he totally ignored me. What a jerk. Riley, you have to help me get back at him. What? No, I don't want to get mixed up in all this toxic drama. You should ask someone else. This guy is so charming that any other girl I'll ask will fall in love with him. But you, Riley, are the only one who would be immune to Cody's charm. Wait, Cody? Cody Nelson? The footballer? Yeah, I told you about him before. Shoot. I should have listened to Nola's boy dramas before. But whatever. Right. What Cody did to you is absolutely outrageous. We gotta teach him a lesson. And for you, Nola, I got your back. Okay, the plan is to ruin his image in front of other girls and make him fall in love with you all at the same time. And then we'll dump him right away, breaking his little heart. But we need to give you a makeover as he only has eyes for girly girls. Nola then called Halsey, a makeup artist from the school over. Yeah, we definitely can seduce a guy with this. I bet lots of girls are falling for you instead. Nola and Halsey then dragged me into a clothing store. The minute I saw racks lined with dresses, my first instinct was to run. I had to try on dozens of dresses, and Halsey trained me to walk like a lady. They even talked about a curtsy. Who curtsies anymore? Then Halsey taught me how to slow dance, which I quickly mastered. But they didn't seem impressed. Halsey suddenly grabbed my waist and took the lead. I was following her steps when, OMG, they look so cute. Eek! Only girls understand each other. What? Do we look like a couple to them? Stay cool, Riley. This is just for revenge. Nola's plan better be worth it. The next day, I brought my princess makeover to school, ready for Cody, when, hey, you look familiar. Have I met you before? Oh, shoot. It's him. Did he recognize me from the match? I know. Must have seen you in my dreams. Phew. False alarm. Cody then asked for my number, and we started going out. During the dates, I was so nervous without Halsey and Nola. Okay, Riley, act proper. You're not in your natural habitat. Gosh, you look like an actual princess. Another time, my mouth watered at the burger on the menu, but despite starving, I tried to keep calm and had to order a salad instead. Aw, only a salad? You eat like a little birdie. <sighs> it's exhausting to be a girl. But after all the dates with me, Cody hasn't announced anything official between us. Is it his natural instinct to be flirting with girls? 
Ugh, Nola's plan's obviously not working. I gotta take matters into my own hands. So I secretly poured some estrogen powder into Cody's protein shake and texted Nola to come see the show. Ha, <laughs> look at the way he dunks the ball. Let's see if he could still be Prince Charming now. Later, he clashed with another player, fell to the ground rolling and whimpering in pain like a baby. I was satisfied for today. Suddenly, I saw Declan walking over and he sat right next to me. Oh no, my buddy can't see me in this embarrassing look. Just then, a basketball came hurtling towards me when Declan's quick reflexes got me behind him and caught the ball with his free hand. Are you all right? Yeah, thanks to this. Friend, here. <laughs> Say, what is a pretty girl like you doing in a sports event like this? Thanks for saving my girlfriend. I can handle it from here. Thank God you're okay, Riley. Aw, he's so sweet, so soft and cute. What? Would you stop saying he's soft and cute? He's not that kind of man. You're right. He's a manly man. We're so sorry, Cody. We didn't mean anything by it. Wow, I didn't know such a little girl like you had such a big voice. I'm so happy to have you by my side. Hey, Riley, would you come to the fundraiser carnival with me? I'll make an announcement to everyone there. Wait, was this guy serious? When I got home that night, I saw Declan waiting outside on the porch. I looked at him and then down at my outfit and back to him in panic. So that really was you back there. So, you really did recognize me. Why didn't you say anything back there? You looked so nervous and acted like you didn't know me, so I didn't want to embarrass you. Anyway, when did you start going out with Cody? Why change so much for him? I explained everything to Declan, the whole revenge plot for Nola and how I'm doing this to get back at Cody for taking away our championship. Well, the Bulldogs were in the wrong for letting you play in the first place. It was a men's final. I don't care. He has to pay for it. Then I stormed inside. I gotta stand my ground. But Nola was there already sitting on my bed. I heard the whole thing. Makes sense now why you were suddenly interested in the plan. Anyway, whatever you're in it for, your main goal is to ruin Cody's reputation. Don't get sidetracked. Okay, guess I have to attend the carnival with Cody then. On the day of the carnival, I saw Cody waiting for me at the entrance. But I couldn't show up looking like this without Halsey. She was dancing her heart out at Coachella all the way in California. Suddenly, Cody and I locked eyes. I frantically looked for my nearest exit, but Cody was coming quick. Suddenly, I felt an arm wrap around my waist and turn me around. It was Declan? I saw Cody give up and walk away. Other girls were trying to approach him, but he just declined them. Was he still looking for me? Maybe he's not the bad guy Nola painted for me. See, he doesn't deserve the whole revenge plot against him. Yeah, I didn't expect that. He seems to like you a lot, and you should just stop this and be yourself. Declan and I shared a brief moment of silence. Under the sunset glow, Declan looks so charming. Has he always looked like this? You suddenly notice how handsome I am? I mean, yeah, you could be quite a catch. How come no one's tried to sweep you off your feet yet? Maybe they have, but none of them have ever been interesting enough. Besides, I already have eyes for someone else. Huh? Um, I, uh, I need to grab a bite. I'm starving. Bye. Declan's just a buddy I've known for ages. Why was my stomach doing a cartwheel just then? Ah! Oh, it's just you. Mission success. Huh? I just saw Cody post you as his official girlfriend. Nola was right. Cody posted his official announcement about us. Now all you have to do is dump him in public. Nola, I have to tell you something. This has gone on for too long. I'm sick of being someone I'm not. And I don't think Cody's that bad of a guy. He totally is. You're not falling for him, are you? Don't disappoint me, Riley. In the next morning, Nola brought Halsey over, saying it was cultural exchange day today at school. The perfect place and time to dump Cody. Too tired to start a fight with Nola. Ugh, I had to go along with it. At school, I stumbled upon Declan. He asked me to join him in the eating competition. It was kind of awkward after I ran away from him yesterday. But such an attractive offer. How could I say no? Man, I was born to do this. We were the last two standing in the competition, but Declan gave up and I won. I wasn't even thinking and I hugged him automatically. When I realized what I'd done, I let go of him, but my heart was racing. Could it have been the adrenaline of eating 12 huge burritos? After the competition, Declan and I were walking off all the food when we stumbled upon Cody. 12 extra extra large burritos in 15 minutes? You won this? Cody! No, this is his! What are you doing with him, anyway? You're my girlfriend. You don't even know Riley for who she is. She's mine. Hold on now, guys. What on earth are you talking about? Don't listen to him. Let's go. You're not going with him. What do you mean? Stop! Let go of me! You're annoying me! This guy is so crazy! 
We gotta go. Now you're telling him I'm crazy? Cody, Riley is the girl you outed during the Bulldogs vs. Knights game. She's just trying to act girly and doing all this to get back at you. Cody was shocked and looked at me waiting. Uh, it's true, Cody. I started all this to get back at you. It just seemed so unfair. I'm just as good as any of the boys on the field. I worked my butt off for that game, and I scored the winning goal just to have it stripped away from me. Riley, actually, I was just so stressed that day, and the Knights were losing. But I didn't do it to discriminate against you in the game. I'm so sorry for doing it to you. I was taken aback by his apology. It was so sincere and honest. <laughs> it's a pity. What is? I actually fell so hard for this girly you. Aw, that's sweet, Cody. Tell you what, I'll make it up to you by bringing my real self to prom. And if you like this look right now, I know just who to introduce you to. <laughs> Deal. By the way, if I'd known sooner, I wouldn't have acted so poorly towards Declan. He seemed really hurt when he chose my side. I felt horrible about what I'd said to Declan. Even if he didn't agree with what I was doing, he was always there for me. But I acted like my best buddy in the world was a jerk in front of Cody. I was feeling all gloomy in my bedroom when Halsey showed up and asked to sleep over. Whatever, make yourself at home. Just leave me alone, okay? Actually, I can't. I saw the fight this afternoon between Declan and Cody. Gotta say, kinda admire Declan for speaking his heart. Unlike someone. What do you mean? Come on, you like Declan, don't you? Huh? N no, we're just homies. Oh yeah? So what you're feeling for Declan is also the same as the other homies of yours? What Halseed said made me think about recent moments I had with Declan. When he protected me from the basketball, when he held me at the carnival, and when I accidentally hugged him at the competition. My heart acted so weird. My feelings for Declan are definitely different from anyone else. Idiot, you do like him. But what you did this afternoon must have hurt him a lot. What should I do now? Why not ask him to the dance? That's right, I gotta redeem myself and make up with Declan. But I still couldn't face him and talk right now. So the next morning, I prepared a letter to send Declan. In the letter, I told him how I realized that I had feelings for him and that I wanted to take him to prom. Then Nola stormed into my room. Why didn't you dump the guy as planned? I explained to her that Cody's actually a confirmed good guy and insisted that she goes to prom. Plus, I had a big surprise for her. I also revealed that I have feelings for Declan and I'm going to send this letter to him. After I told her that, Nola's face perked up and she suggested that she help hand deliver the note just in case Declan was still mad at me. But days passed and I hadn't heard anything from Declan. I guess he was really mad at me and couldn't bring himself to reply to my letter. I really was horrible to him. Halsey came over, cheered me up, and suggested that we go to prom together instead. That really cheered me up and I agreed to go with her. She gave me another makeover, but this time it was more natural. I felt more myself. Halsey and I arrived at prom, and I was confused and disappointed to see Declan showing up with Nola? Neither of them told me they were going together. Right then, Cody appeared. Hey, Riley, you look great. The natural look really suits you. Thanks. Now, I have someone you should meet. Are you happy now, Riley? Being with your so-called enemy? Turns out I didn't know you at all. After I poured my heart out in that letter, he's still so mad at me that he'd attack me like this? I couldn't stand for it, so I fought back, and we broke out in an argument. Enough! What is wrong with you, Declan? You didn't reply to her letter and still have the audacity to be mad at her? What letter? Halsey and I turned towards Nola, and after a moment of nothing, Nola burst into tears. I hate you, Riley! You promised you'd help me get back at Cody, then you abandoned me completely, so I didn't give the letter to Declan. Nola, I never abandoned you. When I realized that Cody was a good guy, I wanted to reintroduce you to him so you both could have a fresh start. So you were going to introduce me to Nola? You like her style, don't you? Yeah, but she thinks I'm a playboy, and she went as far as to create this whole revenge plot against me. This is all your fault for chasing after me and then dropping me for some other girl. Do you know how disheartening that is? I thought you didn't like me, so I moved on. Back then, I just tried to play hard to get. If only you tried a little harder, I'd have let you know. I didn't understand before, but I get it now. Can we start over? I'd like that. The DJ started to play a slow song, and Declan suddenly pulled me in to dance with him. So, that letter, what did it say? It said that I'm sorry for not realizing my feelings earlier. Then, I confess my love to you and asked you to prom. Well then, here's my response. Riley, I liked you the minute I set my eyes on you. I wanted to do everything with you. I wanted to hang out, I wanted to play football with you, and I wanted to be by your side every moment of my waking hour. I could never figure out how you felt, so I hid my feelings for you. At that moment, Declan and I were the only two people in the world. We danced throughout the whole night, and I felt complete. 
And that's why you should just speak your heart, everyone. If you want to hear my story, comment Halsey's story, and I'll see you then. Okay, animators, you can continue. Hi, I'm Celine, and I've called the St. Augustine Orphanage home since I was six. But I'm not actually an orphan. You see, my parents are special agents with secret identities. Sweetie, if one day someone suspicious asks you about your parents, run for your life. I was used to these fleeting, ghost-like visits from my parents. They often took turns sneaking in and out at night, spending the little time they had with me, and always came together for my birthday. And even though I didn't see them much, they taught me some awesome skills. By the age of 12, I was fluent in five languages, could play a variety of instruments, and do a butterfly kick on anyone who needed it. Despite living a secret life and not seeing my parents as much as I wanted, I still felt lucky that I had them both in my life. It's my 17th birthday, a day I should be super excited about. You see, my parents always visit me together on my birthday, but I've been waiting here for ages and there's no sign of them. This was the first year this had happened. I didn't like it one bit. Something was definitely up. The next day in church, we were singing hymns when I spotted this strange man in the crowd staring at me. My instinct were telling me something was up, so I eavesdropped on him, talking to a nun. That girl with blonde hair. How exactly did her parents pass away? He asked about my parents. That meant my life was in real danger. I fled with all my survival skills right away. What really happened to my parents? Have their identities been revealed? I didn't dare to think about it. So I made sure no one was following me before going to the subway and looking for a baggage locker. This was where I needed to come in a run-for-my-life situation. I waited until nobody was around before I opened it with my key. Inside was some money, a dossier documenting a girl's life from childhood to old age, and a letter. Our darling Celine, we're very sorry that you didn't have the normal childhood you deserved. Please don't ever doubt that we cherish and love you with all of our hearts. If you're reading this, it means our identities have been compromised. We've included the documents for your new identity. Stay strong. We will reunite soon. You're a loving mom and dad. XO. If my parents could arrange all this for me, I believe that they could handle anything and come back to me soon. So here I am, under my new identity, Diane. Australia, here I come. My parents left me just enough money to start a new life here, pay for rent, and tuition fees. How perfectly ordinary. Diane's parents were researchers away in the Arctic. She's from a basic family and attended normal public schools, then worked as an office accountant, did not marry or have children. Everything was boringly safe. The thing is, if I was going to be someone else, then I should at least be someone fun. So I didn't start school. Instead, I created and adopted the identity of 20-year-old Harper and started my first money-making idea, Marriage on Demand. With all I'd learned from my parents, I could make a whole lot of money and at the same time experience how a normal family would look like. Perfect. First, I became a Harvard doctor graduate so this privileged guy's parents would give him his inheritance. Next, a posh aristocrat who saved my client from a dreadful arranged marriage. And then a sweet-natured girl who helped my client intimidate their seriously mean friends. As soon as my clients achieved their goals, the contract ended and we went our separate ways. Before I knew it, through my Harper alias, I'd married nine guys in just eight months and become eye-wateringly rich. But as it turned out, the cases I took were all abnormal families. This 10th contract would be my final case. Then I'd say goodbye to Harper and attend college as Diane before I lost all faith in ever getting the family of my dreams. But while driving to my rendezvous, I swear that car was following me. It could be my parents or someone dangerous. Only one way to find out. Now I just had to wait. If they were dangerous, I'd drive straight off this cliff, then swim to safety. Then I saw this gormless, grinning guy peer through my window. He held up a temporary girlfriend contract. Hey, I just want to talk. Could he be my 10th client? Either way, he seemed harmless, so I stepped out of the car. I'm Carlton from the courthouse. You've sure been busy, so I've been assigned to investigate you. As far as I'm aware, it's not illegal to marry multiple times, is it? No, only if they're real and not marriage contracts. Carlton, I only have one client left and I'm not marrying him. I'm his temporary girlfriend, which I believe is legal. So, is there any chance you could turn a blind eye this one last time? Legal or not, I strongly advise you to quit this job and do something more morally upright. Just then, a black car pulled over and a man walked straight towards us. Oh no, had they found me? I'm sorry for getting you into trouble. I turned around, ready to jump, but Carlton suddenly held my hand back. 
No need for that. My boss won't eat you alive. Besides, I haven't told anyone about the contracts yet. Oh, so this man's his boss from the court? Turns out he and his wife happened to see Carlton on their way to the airport and just came to say hi. Hey, Carl, it doesn't say much if this girl would rather jump into the sea than date you. He looked really awkward and I felt bad for the guy. Without thinking it through, I clung onto his arm and gave him my best adoring look. Actually, we're deeply in love. I'm an adrenaline junkie, but you know Carl. He's just so strict about things like this. You're right. Carl is rather stiff. If you loosened up a bit, you may have been promoted by now. After they left, I explained to Carlton that's what my job is, helping nice guys out of unnecessary trouble. Nothing immoral about it. I was about to leave when he suddenly stopped me. I could see his attitude changed. Please, make a contract with me. I know you could help me improve my communication skills and get me promoted. You can see how desperate I am right now. I wasn't sure. I mean, number 10 was meant to be my last client, but just look at that clueless face. Fine, but in return, you must be an attentive boyfriend, and I want to have dinner with you and your family every evening. Carl looked a bit confused, but he agreed to my demands. Ugh, this was probably my last chance to experience a family life. I have a strict don't-be-wife-two-people-at-the-same-time rule, so I'm meeting my other client to gently turn him down. Celine, is that you? S Celine, he knew my name? OMG, that's Matten, the genius pianist from the orphanage. Oh no, this was terrible. He could blow my cover. I, um, I was adopted and go by Harper now. My adoptive parents turned out to be a letdown. I had to fake my identity so I could work on my own. I understand. It's so hard for orphans like us to survive. Yes, it sure is. Look, Matten, things got pretty difficult for me, so I had to take another job in a hurry. I can't do two jobs at once. I'm sorry I have to cancel our contract. Yeah, about that. I already publicly announced I have a girlfriend just a second ago. Pianist prodigy Matten confirmed he's currently dating someone? Matten, I really can't do this. Just tell me who your client is. I can make a deal with him. I can't be with them both, so I called an emergency meeting for them to plead their cases. An article accused me of inappropriate behavior towards female artists. It's completely false, of course. I need a girlfriend to distract the public and make them see I'm not a jerk. I want this promotion. If you won't help me, I'll expose you publicly. Pfft, like that matters. I'll just take you back to the U.S. No, I can't go back there, and I don't want any attention from people either. This is what I'm going to do, Carl. I'll be your girlfriend on weekdays and do anything I can to help you get promoted. In Matin, I'll be your girlfriend, well, pretend to be your girlfriend on the weekend. But my face has to stay out of the media, okay? Once this is done, then it's goodbye Harper and hello, trouble-free, simple Diane. All I have to do is play some music while Matten listens and lets the paparazzi snap photos. I've always admired the way you play music. It follows no rules, but that's what makes it so fearless and fun. His comment made me pine for my parents. They were the reason I played like that. They taught me in the dark, told me to flow with the rhythms without any rules. I miss them so much. I must admit I'd always had a crush on you. When this is over, I want to protect you. I want to be your family. This was sweet, but he didn't know that I already had a family. I just needed to be patient. Then eventually, they'll be back. On weekdays, I joined Carlton for lunch at work and helped him talk to his co-workers and grumpy boss. Then in the evening, I went to his house and gave him tips on how to be more charismatic, make people trust and warm up to him. I also taught him how to walk without slouching and politely greet people. Hi, Mr. Chair. You look great today. Oh, Miss Lamp, are you okay? You shouldn't lose more weight. You're already gorgeous. Isn't that too much? I've never talked like this before. You're doing great. Carlton followed all my advice. He might be a bit clumsy, but in a cute, endearing way. Still, what I anticipated most was joining his family for dinner. I'd never experienced the cozy and warm atmosphere of a family dinner before. Who knew Carl was such a great cook? And so sweet. After only one week, Carl now had friends at work and his boss gave him extra responsibilities. Meanwhile, Matten's reputation also made a rebound thanks to articles like, he doesn't want to be around other girls because he's so passionately in love with this amazing muse. A frantic week quickly passed, which ended with Carlton's family celebrating his new position, all thanks to me. I was so moved I almost cried, but noticed Carlton seemed off. Maybe he was bummed out as he knew this was the end of our contract. After dinner, we went for a stroll around the garden. Then he blurted out, Who are you really? I was super surprised. Then he told me that one of his new jobs was to investigate a girl called Diane who entered the country, then vanished. I know you're Diane. I can recognize those eyes anywhere. 
Yes, I'm Diane, but I only faked my identity to earn money. I know you're lying again. It's fine, you've helped me, so I'll help you too. I faked some info to close the case. Thank you, Carl, this means a lot. I knew how important the laws were to him, but he still broke them. For me. I actually quit my job. What do you mean? What about your promotion? You've tried so hard for that. It's okay. I realized I didn't like it so much anyway. I felt terrible that he'd given up his job because of me. But he didn't need me anymore. Our contract had to end, right? Now it's time to end Matten's contract. Then I can go back to being Diane. However, I showed up at the villa to a swarm of reporters. Are you Matten's girlfriend? Please get out of the car. Are you the girl who dates him for dollars, not love? Please show yourself and verify the news. Looks like the news of Matten's girlfriend being a girl who only married for money had leaked. I sat there not knowing what to do. Then I saw Matten coming out of the villa hand in hand with some shiny haired girl. These rumors about my girlfriend are all lies. Amber is a wonderful, kind hearted soul and I couldn't be happier. Oh, I suppose that's pretty smart of him. Finding someone with a nice background was the only way to save his reputation for now. Goodbye, Matten. I wish you well. It seems he couldn't bring himself to ruin his career to protect me the way Carlton did. Now I was free to be Diane and attend this public school my parents wanted me to. Hmm, I was wondering when you'd show up. You're rather popular. A man with a scar has been asking about you. Someone with a scar was looking for Diane? The moment I realized someone was watching me behind the door, my instinct told me to run for my life. I rushed to the window and jumped down, just to catch Carlton peeping at me. What are you doing here? I wanted to see you, so I tracked down Diane. I didn't expect to find you here, but I like you a lot, and there was no time. They saw us together, so I pulled him away. You're driving like crazy, Diane. Who are they? Why are they chasing us? I don't know. All I know is that they're dangerous. He took his phone out to call 911, but I stopped him. No cops. I can't trust anyone but myself, Carl. I'm so sorry for dragging you into this mess. My parents often told me the best way to escape a chase is to jump into the water. However crazy it seems, please trust me. I took a sudden turn and plunged the car straight into the sea. In the water, I unfastened the seatbelt and turned to see Carl already got out of his. He pulled my hand and we swam through the window. The waves drifted us onto a beach, but I had no strength left to move an inch. They're gonna catch us. Celine, sweetie, please wake up. I rubbed my eyes and saw the golden sand, Carlton, and my mom and dad? Am I dead? M mom? No, sweetie, you're very much alive. Turns out the people chasing us were my parents. After 10 years on the job, they finally eliminated the criminal gang and retired. Dad ended up getting the scar, but it's all over now. We could finally be a normal family. You sure made it hard for us to track you down by using a different identity. We should have known our cunning daughter would have created a more challenging life. Like father, like daughter. Huh? You're not Diane? Carlton, my name's Celine. Mom, Dad, this is Carlton, my boyfriend. It was so cute seeing him blush. Then he quickly held his hand out and introduced himself to them. It's lovely to meet you both. I care greatly for your daughter and I always will, no matter how mischievous she is. Turns out it's pretty amazing just being Celine. I started school as myself and so far, so good. I'm living with my kind, talented, and normal parents. We're having the best time together. And I get to date this cute, caring chef. The best part is I can finally stop running for my life and just enjoy the people I love most. I was walking down the hallway to see the infamous dude standing there, doing his old trick to pick on some shy student. Get that filthy hand off him now! Then I grabbed him and threw him away like a piece of paper. Ah, that's better. Konnichiwa, I'm Yukiko from Japan, the daughter of Fuji, a famous martial arts master and the principal of a karate school. As his only child, it's up to me to evolve my warrior spirit and protect the weak from any baka. And this shy girl is Chiharu, the one I saved from a fight with the rival school gang. And ever since then, we became besties. Well, that's also how I earned the nickname Big Boss. I don't really care about it, but it does have some perks. I always had the best reserved seat next to the window, a desk drawer full of snacks, and on top of that, the kid was competing every day to do my homework. However, it also caused me some complications. I seem to have caught the eye of Jun, that rival school's gang leader. He bought me flowers and sent me these cheesy cupcakes every day, but I only gave him a no. Hey, he comes again. If I was your boyfriend, never let you go. Keep you on my arm, girl. You keep go, never be alone. Tomato, tomato, throwing tomatoes. Even when the guard came carrying him away, he was still shouting. 
Yukiko Daiskura! Gosh, he's such a bug. Later, I came into the classroom and found everyone was going cuckoo over something. How noisy! That's the new student. He's just so handsome. As if you could tell someone's handsome from the back. But when he turned around, my eyes almost bulged from their sockets. It's Akira. Back when we were little, I adored Akira from the moment I first saw him. To me, he was even cuter than my favorite Mochi Shiba plushie. So I followed him everywhere and gave him all the candies I had. But he didn't like it that much. Why did you give her my candies? I like Akira. If you take him from me, I'll punch you. Hey, martial arts is not about fighting nonsense. You fierce kid, I hate you! After a while, Akira's family moved away and I'd completely lost contact with him. And now, he's back. Our eyes met, but he looked so cold and turned away. He didn't recognize me? Fine. It was so embarrassing facing him again anyway, so I decided to avoid him like the plague since then. And just like that, with his excellent academic ability, Akira soon fell into place as the top student, while I'm a bit different. I may have been a black belt in the karate, but exams were definitely not my thing. Congratulations, you've excelled at coming last again. So, Yukiko, I've appointed another student to tutor you. Please don't say his name, please don't say his name, please, please, please. Akira, I nearly died on the spot. Can anybody throw me to Mars, please? Man, it's super awkward. I kept looking at the ground when he blurted out, Hi, Yukiko. Long time no see. So, he does remember me? During the lesson, I couldn't focus, and my body was heating up. I kept my mouth shut while he was immersed in his lecture. If there's anything you don't understand, feel free to ask. I plucked up my courage and said, Why didn't you like me when we were kids? You're still acting like before. <laughs> I'm trying to teach you, but your head's stuck in the clouds. Focus. He didn't say he hated me, did he? My heart fluttered again. Guess I'd have to try harder to get his attention then. But things didn't exactly go as planned. During the lessons with Akira, my phone rang constantly with calls and messages. Seemed like my goons were in trouble and they needed my help. I tried my best to ignore it, but finally gave in. I've got something to do. I'll be right back. Hey, those morons. They're always messing around, then leave it to me. Problem solved. Only that, lucky for you, I got there in time. In time to cause more trouble, I'd have eaten them for breakfast without you. Back at school, I saw Akira standing at the gate with a clearly not happy face. Akira, it's not like what you think. I- You find it hard to study, but fighting seems to come naturally to you, huh? Who the freak are you? How dare you talk to my girl like that? Akira, I fight to help people. It's not nonsense. Help? I suppose brainless people only know how to talk with their fists. June immediately lunged at Akira, raising his fists at him. I had to hold him back right away and told him to go. The silence went on for some minutes, but when he was about to leave, I couldn't stand it anymore. Just because I liked you then, you think you have the right to look down on me? What? Hear this. I do like you, but it doesn't mean I will like you forever. I don't care, but I'm sorry if the truth I spoke made you feel that I looked down on you. And you know what? If you can't take my tutoring seriously, then we're done. Fine, go! See if I care. I, the big boss myself, have my own limits and cannot be chasing him all the time. But I couldn't deny that a pit was dropping to the bottom of my stomach. I just want to go home and curl up under cover. Then I arrived at my family's karate academy to see it was all sealed off. And my dad was sitting on the doorstep holding a letter. Dad? What happened? Yukiko, I'm bankrupt. I had no choice but to sell the academy to moneylenders. I've lost everything. No! This academy is our family legacy. My dad's life's work. We couldn't lose it. So I followed the address on the letter, but there I met an unexpected person. June! Turns out, his dad is my dad's creditor. All or nothing, I decided to get straight to the point to him. What do my family have to do to get our martial arts school back? June came over and whispered something in his ear. Then he pondered a while and said, My son kept goofing around. Change him and the martial arts school is back to yours. But how? I want you to get engaged to my son. Are you serious? You think I'm a joke? Then I immediately stood up and left. That was insane. Hey, why are you behaving like that? You're still asking why? It's down to that dude, isn't it? He's just some preppy know-it-all who doesn't even like you. You, you know nothing. He also likes me, I think. Is that so? Then prove it. Make Akira fall in love with you within two weeks, and I'll convince my father to extend the deadline by three months. Fail, and we get engaged. I'm the one who is always by your side. 
No way I agree with your stupid deal. Go ahead, refuse. The martial arts school will be permanently closed tomorrow. Wait, I, I, okay, I'm in. Lucky enough, I had Chiharu, the love guru, to help me cook up the perfect Get Akira scheme. Though she'd been single, like, forever. <laughs> Firstly, I told my gang that Akira'd soon to be my BF, and also their boss, so he deserved a special treat. Wherever he went, other students bowed 90 degrees to greet him. They tended to his every need, carried his bag, and were always at his service. But he seemed not so comfortable about this. Ask your goons to stop their nonsense. Okay, as long as you agree to my conditions. What? Tutor me again. Oh, and have lunch together. And walk to and from school? I, I can't. Okay then, guys. Fine. Secondly, you needed to find out what Akira liked, but he'll refuse to answer my questions for sure. My fake council survey will answer that. Then she handed out the paper to the whole class. My goofy Chiharu did get it done this time. Okay, according to a philosopher, the way to a man's heart is through his stomach. Akira's most favorite food is beef, so I rummaged through all the local supermarkets to find A5 Wagyu beef and prepared this perfect meal for him. Akira, eat this. Oh, thank you, Cream Puff. How come you know I like beef? How did you get in here? I know you miss me, so I come to visit. Before I could say anything, Akira shook his head and walked off. Okay, the first step is always the hardest. Next, seeing that Akira liked horror movies, I lied to him that Chiharu stood me up, so I had an extra ticket. It's insidious. How could he refuse? But as soon as we sat down, a familiar face caught my attention. Jun! Stop messing with me, you child! Eh? I'm a horror fan, just like you. We're sure a match made in heaven. I tried to ignore him and focus on my plan. This was the third time I watched this, so I knew exactly when there'd be a jump scare. It's time. I pasted a whining look on my face and was about to lean on Akira when June suddenly screamed his lungs out and jumped at me. It was not until he fell asleep that we had a bit of privacy. But from then till we left, Akira didn't speak a word and even asked to leave early. That's not okay. If things kept going this way, the whole plan would definitely fail. And it means I'd have to get engaged to June. No! The next day, I wasn't in the mood for dealing with my friends, so I lingered back in the classroom and read through Akira's notes. Oh, what's this? So, he does care about me. I can see one ray of hope. Akira, I want to improve my studies. Help me? Oh, okay. I was waiting outside for Akira to get us some bubble teas before we started, when suddenly this thief darted out and snatched this old lady's bag. I dove in there to help, but he knocked me to the ground and ran away. Here you go. You're already fighting again? Don't you have anything better to do? I'm not fi- Forget it anyway. This brave young lady helped me. W what? Say no more. I'm a bad person no matter what. Then I stormed off without looking back. I was so stupid to catch feels with that insensitive one. Then my knee suddenly collapsed. Right then, a hand reached out and gently wrapped a bandage around my knee. Leave me alone. Get on my back. Shut up. Come on. I couldn't help but smile through my frown, and my heart did a cartwheel. I clambered onto his back and looped my arms around his neck. Hey, I'm sorry. I didn't know that you- It's okay. Are you dumb? An injured leg is not enough? It's nothing. And- you don't have to carry me like this. Am I heavy? What? <laughs> if I say yes, will you jump off? No way. After that day, Akira changed towards me. He joined me for lunch and even gave me a cute cupcake and agreed to go to Cat Cafe with me, even though he's allergic. And the classes went so smoothly. He was sweet like a lollipop and answered to all my silly questions. One time, I even accidentally saw him putting a lot of bandages in my locker. Aww. Winning the bet didn't seem so impossible then, but suddenly a girl approached him. It was Amaya, the school's popular girl. They chewed the fat. Then she leaned closer and whispered something to him. His face suddenly turned cold. Then he walked away. I was about to go after him when my phone beeped. Can't tutor you today. I have a play audition. So, turns out Akira and Amaya were both in this play. Fine, if Akira's Romeo, then I must be Juliet. I made it to the final round with my big boss energy, which meant I got to act out a scene with Akira to see who got the female lead between me and Amaya. Oh dear, look at them, being all clingy for what? That snake was all over my poor Akira like a rash. Ugh, if Chiharu hadn't constantly held me back, I'd have jumped there and given her a piece of my mind. And now it's time for me to shine. But why is Akira's face darkened? It's okay, maybe he's trying to be professional? My bounty is as boundless as the sea. My love... My love, as adoring as, as a puppy dog's nose. 
Um, yes. So I may have forgotten the words, but it wasn't that bad. <laughs> He may pick me for my quick thinking, and... I choose Amaya, miss. Hey, why did you pick her? You shouldn't ask me. Ask yourself instead. Then he left with Amaya without glancing at me. But today is the end of the two-week deadline. I thought you'd have some feelings for me, too. It was pouring rain. I trudged home, all collapsed, tears and rain falling down all over my face. It was all over. The bed I play, the boy I love. I should have known better that it was me onto a loser right from the outset. Through my teary eyes, I saw June running towards me. Yukiko, what's wrong? Tell me. I... I lost. What? The bet. Between us. I lost it. I was wrong. About everything. Who cares about the bet? You might get a cold, you know. Get inside. But why you're here? I don't care if you think it's too late. I'm telling you anyway. I know that I'm not perfect like him. I do say the wrong thing. I forget all the time, but I... I can protect and will never hurt you. So will you... marry me? My head was spinning, and in a moment of weakness, I said yes. At least I can save my dad's school and be with the right person who truly cares about me, instead of chasing some jerk who thought so low of me. I confided in Chiharu and my family about this, but kept it a secret from everyone else. <sighs> my father didn't approve it at first, but seeing my determination, he reluctantly agreed. It was our fitting day. I was with June discussing our wedding, but he seemed distracted and kept checking his phone. Then he said he had to take a call and hurried out. Sensing something was up, I followed him. Huh? Why is he talking to Amaya? You have to thank me for your new fiancé. I told Akira about your bet. Um, excellent job, as promised. It's not about the money. It's about making Akira mine. I don't get why both you and my beautiful Yukiko like that dude so much. Anyway, Yukiko's waiting for me. Gotta go. I couldn't believe what was in front of me. What the heck are you doing here? So it's you who made up everything the whole time? No, Yukiko. Let me explain. I trusted you, June. But look what you've done. You know what? You win. Do your worst. I don't care anymore. Then I ran home as fast as I could. Why do boys all fool me around like that? Right when I felt more disheartened than ever... I met the one that I didn't want to see the most. What was Akira doing here? Yukiko, let's talk. We have nothing to talk about. Chiharu told me what you're doing. You can't marry June. You liked me, so you mustn't fall for another one that easily. What? So you're the commander of my feelings now? Aren't you with Amaya? I'm not, and I never did. Listen, I was so angry to find out I was just part of your bet with June, so I ignored you. But then Chiharu told me why you did it and made me understand. So what? Anyway, you never liked me. I'm not gentle and too fierce, as you said before. Don't try to pity me. I don't. It's that I do like you. At first, I thought you were the type of person who'd use violence to solve any problem. But the more I got to know you, the more I learned about your pure heart. I shouldn't have judged you so quickly. I'm sorry. What just happened? I might be dreaming? But no, Akira, my seven-year crush, just confessed his love with me. So, Akira and I got together. June was furious about it, but he kept his word, and now my dad has three months to pay off his debt. I'm helping him out by teaching karate classes to earn money, something I really enjoy. Everything was great, too great, until... Yukiko, I gotta tell you something. I... I have to go abroad to study. I'll leave. Tomorrow. What? I don't understand. Why so sudden? I prepared for it months ago, but I couldn't tell you. I didn't want to make you sad. Will you... wait for me? Of course not. I may get bored and start liking another by that time. It's time. I stood still watching the train pass by until I noticed Akira's melancholy smile. I liked you seven years ago, and now I still do. So of course I can wait for you. Come back soon, Akira. My precious Sunday is ruined because of my not-so-precious sister, Emma, who insisted on dragging me to church for some sister time. We walked in to see the priest rushing over. Welcome in. You must be our new member, Janet. Whoa! whoa Just then, the holy statues nearby all fell over and shattered to pieces. It's a bad omen. She's a jinx. No, no, no! You devil! Get out of here! Yep, that's me. You're probably wondering how I ended up in this situation. Hi, my name's Janet. If you think I'm a jinx too, you're seriously wrong. Because animators, we're one that last scene. Pause it right there and... See that? That's my sister, Emma. And fast forward a bit more. Pan over, please. There. That right there is the ringmaster behind my so-called bad luck. You must be wondering why I hadn't exposed Emma that day. 
It's because everyone is fooled by her naive Cinderella look and never believed how a living angel could do such mischievous deeds. But the truth is, she's the devil. She did everything to make me look like a walking disaster everywhere I go. But who am I, huh? That night, to get back at Emma, I hid under the bed till she was sound asleep, wrapped my icy cold hands around her ankles, jumped out from under the bed, and BOO! Emma screamed through the roof, and our parents walked into the room worried just to see me laughing hysterically. Right then, the police on patrol also barged in, thinking something real wrong went on in our house. We ended up spending the night trying to explain to them nothing happened, and they finally left. Do you know how many sleepless nights we've had just because of you girls' petty fights? That's it. I'm signing you both up to join a community farm from tomorrow. What? But Dad, I can't live amongst animals and dirt. For once, I agree with Emma. There's no way I'm going there. You're not going back till you learn to live with each other. Living with Emma 24-7? I'd much rather be the jinx now. So the next morning, Mom and Dad drove us to the farm to live off the land and bond together. But look at this tranquility and picturesque scenery. Maybe coming here wasn't such a bad idea after all. Suddenly, a loud obnoxious track started playing from inside my suitcase, startling the animals, and they went rogue. Stop the music! But my suitcase was locked. I caught Emma smirking, pressing her phone, and the music suddenly stopped. Once everything was under control, the farmers gave me looks of disapproval. Just when I thought things couldn't be any worse, a trailer nearby slipped off and began to roll downhill, heading straight for an oblivious farmer. Emma immediately swooped in and pushed herself and the farmer out of harm's way just in the nick of time. Richard, are you okay? Oh, yes, thanks to this young lady. You saved my life. What a good luck charm you are. That trailer has been sitting there for ages without any problems. Why did it suddenly break just now? Oh, it's my sister. She has this reputation for bringing bad luck wherever she goes. I apologize on her behalf. No, 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 no. Don't listen to her. She's evil. That's not something you should say to your sister. Look at her. What an angel. Emma immediately activated her manipulating power. Aww. Come on. We got the nicest room for you. <laughs> hey, what about me? The next morning, I was told to milk the cows while Emma didn't even have to lift a finger, just wandering around and pulling pranks on me. In a panic, a guy appeared and helped me out. What happened here? The hoses are all snipped off. I'm so sorry about that. It's my sister's stupid prank to get me look like bad luck. Interesting. Oh well, we'll hand milk the cows until we get them replaced. Hand milk? That'd take forever. Emma's gonna have to pay. Hey, no need for that. I'll give you a hand. I'm Kai, by the way. He gave the brightest smile, and I instantly felt better. I'm Janet. Thanks for helping me, but which buttons do I push to get milk? Kai cracked up, and I felt like the dumbest thing in the world. I'm sorry, but that was so cute. Okay, you don't push any buttons. You squeeze it, like this. Just then, Sylvia walked by and saw us. Well, well, well. Who makes you smile like that, Kai? Janet, you are really something, huh? As she left, I felt my heart racing and saw Kai blushing also. Whew, it sure feels hot like summertime. So, Kai, how long have you been living here? Just recently. I'm actually a skier from the city too, but I came here due to some stuff. Come on, let's go sell the milk. Kai and I then made our way to the bustling market. Surprisingly, customers were eager to get their hands on our milk. I was ready to make my first hard-earned cash when suddenly... Ahem, <laughs> you'd better watch out. You'd better not buy, better not drink this milk right here. Jinxie Janet's coming to town. The crowd buzzed with concern over our milk. Actually, I thought someone else was a jinx. You see, our milk is especially fresh today. All thanks to my good luck charm, Janet. She and I worked all morning to milk the cows by hand. Thanks to Kai's words, the crowd was excited again. Just like that, we sold out in just a few hours. Woohoo! But when we got home, people started praising Emma for bringing good luck to the business. Actually, it was Kai and me who milked the cows, and more thanks to Kai who did most of the heavy lifting. She has nothing to do with this. The room suddenly felt awkward and people started to look away. Only Sylvia cared to acknowledge us. I see. You two make a great team. What about us? I think we'll make a better team. Get off of me, you creep. Ouch. Feisty. Oh my gosh. Are you okay? Why are you acting like such an animal, Janet? 
I'm all right. She may be a bit cold right now, but she'll warm up to me in no time. Right, princess? Emma immediately gave me a death stare. Aiden, why are you here? I'm here for you, brother dearest. Mom and Dad are worried sick back home. Holy cow, these two are related? But they're nothing alike. Welp, it does explain why their tension was scorching up the room. Stop it, you two. Always with the bickering. It's getting late. Janet, will you go and lock the barn door? Oh, oh yes, definitely. But before I reached the barn, a hand suddenly pulled me back. Keep your claws off of Aiden. He's mine. Oh, I see. You're smitten with him, huh? Well, too bad, because he seems to like me instead, sister. How dare you? Emma dashed ahead of me towards the barn, turned all the lights on, blew on the deafening whistle, and the sheep went wild again. I desperately tried to stop the panic herd, but no use. Only when the farmer showed up and let the shepherd dog do his job was the scene under control. This is all your fault. You'll bring us nothing but bad luck and chaos. That's not true. I was trying to help while this was Emma's doing. Stop with all the blaming and start learning some manners, will you? <laughs> I was stunned. Behind Richard, Emma grinned slyly. She won this time, but not for long. Because how about I steal Emma's crush, a.k.a. Aiden, right in front of her? <laughs> well, actually, I didn't really have to steal anything. Because Aiden always found his way to me first. And he also brought Kai along. It was like something was going on between them, and they kept fighting to get my attention. They showered me with food, fought over the seat next to me at dinner, and wouldn't let me lift anything remotely heavy. It was getting a little annoying, but seeing Emma fuming with jealousy each time is so worth it. <laughs> One afternoon, Kai and I were picking flowers in the field when he gently tucked a flower in my hair. It looks good on you. Then, he lifted my face and leaned in closer. I was floating in the summer breeze, ready for a kiss, when we both got shaken up by the engine revving. Aiden? So pretty thing. Wanna go out with a date with me? She's with me. Can't you see? Well, maybe I'm blinded. Blinded by my love for you. Um, how about you two can show some brotherly love and go together, huh? Then I walked off, only to see Emma's blonde head sticking out from the flowers. Hey, Aiden, on second thought, I'd love to go with you. Shall we? Driving away, I could see Emma furious. And Kai, with sad eyes following me? But the thing was, this was hella awkward. I don't feel like flirting if there was no Emma. And he, well, I don't know, couldn't stand it anymore. So I told him to stop at this random clothing store and insisted he try on this fancy suit. Whoa, you cleaned up nicely, huh? Do I not look good usually? Well, you kind of look like a hooligan. <laughs> Is that genuine joy I see on your face? What? I'm always smiling. Oh, really? You and Kai were ready to bite each other's heads off just then. You don't know everything about us, Janet. I know you have a thing for him, but I can never let you two be together. Not this time. We came back to the farm to see Emma waiting for us, all agitated. You tramp! Isn't Kai enough for you? Now you're playing the double game with Aiden? And you're just jealous because Aiden doesn't like you. That's right. I only have eyes for Janet. She and Kai were never together, so quit sticking your nose into our business. Emma couldn't utter a word. For the first time, she seemed so vulnerable, then rushed away in tears. Look what you did, brother. Playing with both Emma's and Janet's hearts is a low blow. You're one to talk. Wasn't the thing with Tina your low blow? Tina? Tina who? Tina was your crush. I had nothing to do with her. It's about time you get over that. That's not what Tina said. She told me you flirted with her, and you abandoned her when she's falling for you. She lied, okay? She wanted to use you against me, and never once reciprocated her obsessive behaviors. I just want to leave everything behind and enjoy my life here, with her. So Aiden, please, just let us be. Too bad. She seems to like me instead. <laughs> Can't you see? She doesn't care if her sister likes me. She still chose me over you. Dang, those words hit me hard. I didn't realize what I'd done to Emma all along. <sighs> it's time to end all these silly sibling conflicts. Guys, stop. Can't you see you're hurting each other just like Emma and I? Janet, this jerk plays with you and Emma. He deserves a fist or two. No, Kai. I'm not exactly innocent either. I was also using Aiden to get back at Emma. You what? I know, I know. But all these petty revenge doesn't bring us any good. No one wins at all. And honestly, I regretted having hurt Emma. And so should you guys. <laughs> you want this golden boy to drop his sky-high ego? Yeah, good luck with that. I'm not a golden boy, Aiden. <laughs> Are you kidding me? With all your success and skiing trophies, mom and dad can even see me behind all that. When you left home, they freaked out and made me go looking for you. Do you know the reason I quit skiing and left home? 
because mom and dad wouldn't stop pressuring me. It's suffocating. Every time I stand on the ring, my whole body shakes like crazy. I'm not perfect, Aiden, and I did not want to take away any attention from you. I'm sorry if you ever feel that way. Well, I didn't know. You could have told us what you'd gone through. To who? To mom and dad? The ones who keep pushing and nagging? Sorry I wasn't there for you. Heck, I was the worst. Right? You two could work this out. Now if you excuse me, I have my own sibling conflict to resolve. I was about to leave when we heard Emma screaming. Fire! Fire! Help! We immediately rushed to her, and the fire already caught on the haystack. It was spreading fast. I... I accidentally knocked over the oil lamp. What do we do now? You go call the firefighter. Aiden, you go get everyone here. Us two, we will go get water. Go, go, go! Kai and I tried our best to pour bucket after bucket of water, but it only stopped the fire from spreading, not put it out. We almost exhausted ourselves when the farmers arrived along with the firefighter. And luckily, after half an hour, everything was under control. Phew! But then, the farmers started surrounding me. It was because of you, isn't it? Every time incidents happen, you're always on the scene. Coincident? I think not. There we go again. But this time, I'm too beat up to even say anything. Then, there was Emma, petrified in fear, so I used every last effort to stand up. That's right, I knocked over the oil lamp and caused this fire. What are you doing? It's okay, I'm used to this. No, it was my fault. Janet's just trying to take the fall. In fact, this whole time, I was the one doing all the damage and blaming it on Janet. Was this for real? Emma standing up for me? You! Is this some kind of childish joke? You could have really harmed everyone here. This is our life work, not your girls' playground. I... I'm truly sorry. That's it. Tomorrow morning, you'll have to leave here for good. Both of you. We had no choice but to call our parents to pick us up. Meanwhile, I gotta pack my stuff. Hey, I know I've been mean to you since forever, so why did you still take the blame for me? I'm just tired of petty fights. Besides, I feel bad for stealing Aiden away from you. I don't have any feelings for him, and I don't think he falls for me either. I just wanted to mess with you. I figured. Um, I actually heard what you guys were talking about before, and it hit me hard. You know, I used to enjoy being the only child. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but honestly, when you came, it felt like all the attention and love was stripped away from me. I felt so lonely and jealous, so I decided to make you the center of attention, but in the worst way possible. I'm sorry. It's okay. It's all in the past now. I just want us to get along. And me not be called a jinx anymore. You got it. The next morning, our parents arrived all angry. We were so ready for a long-term grounding. But once they saw us holding hands, they were pleased. Honey, I think your plan worked. I knew it. You two can be little troublemakers, but deep down, you still love each other. Come on, let's go home. Can we just wait for a few minutes? I don't want to leave without saying goodbye to Kai. But what took him so long? I gotta get going. Then Kai finally showed up. Wait up. I rushed out of the car and ran to give him a big hug. I thought you wouldn't come to say goodbye. How could I not? Especially when you forget the most important thing. Really? What is it? It's me, you silly. Oh, you're coming back to the city? Yes, I have a reason to be back now. To the city, to skiing, and what is it? It's you. Suddenly, a tree fell over right beside us and crashed the mailbox, causing all of the mail to fly out. Huh, <laughs> you really are bad luck, aren't you? Hey, that tree was already rotten. And don't you think that it barely missing us means I'm good luck? I'm just kidding. Hey, it's me again, Amy. Last time we spoke, I had made a huge discovery. But before we get to that, let me just remind you how we got here. My father's death left me completely devastated. So mom suddenly convinced me to travel to take my mind off of it. But instead of having a good time, I accidentally got stranded on this exotic island that's owned by a native tribe who do not like foreigners. Luckily, I met Silas, who helped me survive here, and we actually have gotten pretty close. <laughs> We're having so much fun that for a second I forgot that I had to go back, until I heard the rumor that my accident could have been staged. Would my own mother really have caused me to end up here? I needed to go home immediately to find out. And Silas was willing to help with all his might, but it's been a few days, and I haven't heard anything back from him. I waited eagerly, then impatiently for him to come. Finally, one afternoon, I heard a noise outside. I quickly went down to check. To my surprise, it wasn't Silas. It was Nora, and as usual, she looked annoyed to see me. I tried to tell her Silas wasn't here, but she pushed past me anyway and grabbed a stick to draw something. What are you doing? Abstract art? There. Island. I see. People. Then I got it. There is an island? With people? Can we get there? Yes. Can. Go. 
We can take a boat there? She nodded again and signaled me to follow her. Oh my god! I jumped with excitement! Maybe I was wrong about her. Nora led me to the shore, where she uncovered a small boat hidden behind a bush. Go away! Now! Go! Go! Nora pulled me towards the boat, sat me down, and started pushing the boat towards the water. Isn't it a little late to sail now? Wind! Wind faster! As we reached the edge of the tide, I realized, Wait! I need to tell Silas I'm leaving! Nora immediately became frustrated. Silas! With Dad! Danger! I didn't quite believe her. But I also didn't know if I'd get another chance like this. I couldn't imagine leaving Silas behind without a goodbye. I felt a pit in my stomach. But we will meet again someday. Definitely. Our family has all the money to rescue him later. Just hang on a bit more, hun. I'll go get help. Nora kept pushing me, and she's right. The patrol could detect me at any moment. So I started paddling away. See you again, Silas. But I only managed to go for a few feet, and then it's like my boat got stuck on something. I turned around to see... Silas? What do you think you're doing? Hey! Nora said that there is an inhabited island nearby, and I didn't want to miss the chance. Get off the boat! It's too dark and too dangerous to go out there by yourself. I'll go and check it out first and come back by morning to let you know if it's safe. Stay here! I was confident in his sailing ability, but it seemed Nora wasn't. She ran to cling to his arm, begging him not to go. Still, he ignored her and got on the boat. Nora glared at me before storming off, but I stayed on the shore for a moment watching Silas disappear into the dark sea. Soon enough, the winds grew stronger and the rain started coming down hard. The storm lasted through the night. I stayed up, waiting in the cave where I spent my first night on the island. The rain stopped by dawn. I couldn't sit still and kept marching back and forth along the shore, looking for any signs of Silas. Nora returned soon after, yelling at me in her native tongue. I didn't understand anything she was saying, but I knew she was just as worried for Silas as I was. He'll be back soon, safe and sound. I trust him. And moments later, there he really was, coming back to shore. I couldn't help but run up and hug him as soon as he stepped out of the boat. I asked if he was okay and how he dealt with the rain, and Silas answered all of my questions with a tight hug. But soon we were interrupted by Nora. She shouted angrily and then stormed off. Silas chased after her and said some things that seemed to calm her down. That island is actually your family's gem mine. I've let them know that their boss lady is alive and well and ready to go home. Oh my god, really? They have their ship ready just a bit further offshore since it's dangerous to get close to the island, you know. Just sail out a little bit and they'll pick you right up. Yay! I'm finally leaving! We're finally... Silas stopped walking and looked at me sadly. Come on, let's go! I can't go with you. Nora will only let you go peacefully if I stay here. If I try to leave with you, she'll tell her father. My heart sank. We'll see each other again, I promise. How? Where there's a will, there's a way. Silas squeezed my hand and then let me go. I tried not to look back at him as I got onto the boat and set sail. I traveled for what could have been a few minutes or a few hours. I couldn't tell anymore until I was finally spotted by a larger vessel. They set out a lifeboat for me, and once on board, I was well taken care of by everyone, offered food and warm clothes. But first thing first, I had to contact my family. I called home, and the person on the other end was my grandmother. She's as surprised to hear my voice as me hearing hers. Turns out, after all the shenanigans that happened after my father's death, my grandma had moved into our house to take care of things and wait for my return. We cried for a good ten minutes, and then I told her not to worry. I was safe, and that I'd be home soon. When I got home, Grandma, Nanny Emma, and my sister Briona rushed to greet me. As my sister hugged me tightly, I realized how much I had truly missed them, and also realized that my mom was really nowhere to be seen. No one made any mention of her in any way. I worked up the nerve to ask my grandma about her. Right when the police said there were signs of foul play in your disappearance, I already got suspicious. Then when Emma said it was your mother who suggested you go there and play those silly games, I immediately kicked her out. People are truly full of surprises. Do you really think Mom was masterminding all this? She was really trying to get both of you. Briona was lucky she forgot her passport. Don't be glum, dear. You still have me and Briona and Emma, too. We all love you and care about you very much. Now, go have some rest. It must have been a long journey for you. The next day, as soon as I got up, I went looking for my sister to confirm the things Grandma had said. When I found her, I couldn't stop the tears from spilling out. How could Mom have been the one to do this? Why would she do something like this to her own children? Amy, never listen to a story from one side only. Huh? Do you know something I don't know? Just don't jump into conclusions yet. She then excused herself to work and hurriedly left before I could ask anything else. 
I kept thinking about what Brianna said, but couldn't come up with any other speculation. As I passed my parents' room, I noticed a box sitting outside the door. It's full of my mother's belongings. Nanny Emma is probably packing my mom's stuff out of here. Something in the box caught my eye. I opened it up and found that it was a photo album of me since I was a kid. And next to each picture is some love notes. This is definitely my mom's handwriting. My eyes landed on a photo of myself playing the piano. And my mother wrote, Sweet Pea playing my favorite song. She meant so well. But I was always the ungrateful, rebellious one. Was that why she stopped loving me? Did I do anything that terrible for her to want me gone? I suddenly missed her. I found myself taking the photo up to the piano room, some place I've never gone voluntarily. But as I reached for the doorknob, I heard voices coming from the inside. I peeked through the ajar door. Stop it. It's lucky enough that you didn't get caught. Just get out of here before it's too late. And throw all of my effort in vain? No way. My plan was going so well. How on earth could she survive? So, plan B. You need to secure that spot in the board of directors before Amy gets in the way, and I'll take care of the rest. But... Oh god, them? They were behind all this? That night, I waited until I had everyone together to make an exciting announcement. Tomorrow, I'm officially going to start working for the company. I've been working on a proposal to pitch to the board of directors to gain their approval. That's wonderful, dear. Don't you think you need some sort of rest, sweetheart? You went through a big ordeal and... I'm ready. I'm totally fine. Well, Briona will also be returning to the company, and I'm glad I'll be able to help her out. The more hands, the better. I'm so glad you want to join the company. Later that evening, Nanny came into my room with a warm glass of milk. Oh, Emma, you always take such good care of me. Well, tomorrow's going to be a big day, and you need to get a good night's rest. Thank you. Finish your milk before it gets cold, sweetie. Good night. I hugged the warm milk glass and smiled at her as she walked out. Okay, one last revision, and then I'll go prepare my outfit for tomorrow. But my eyes, so tired. Suddenly, I was woken up by a sound at the door. Then it slowly opened, followed by footsteps. Someone is walking towards me. She's looking for my documents. Aha! Time to wrap up your play, Emma. Oh, sweetie, go to sleep properly in bed. I'll, I'll help you tidy up. Cut the act, you witch. What do you think you're going to find here? My presentation for tomorrow? Joke's on you. It's a trap. But the milk, you've drank it all. You mean the glass of milk-flavored hypnotic? I've poured it down the drain. Sorry. Suddenly felt lactose intolerant. Bold of you to think you can fool me in my own house. I've seen everything. But why do you want to take me down that bad? Emma, aren't we? Because my daughter, Briona, deserves this company more than you. Before I could even process that information, Emma was rushing towards me holding a chloroform-soaked rag. Just as she backed me into a corner, the door flew open. My grandma and Briona rushed in, followed by the police, who restrained Emma right away. Briona ran over yelling, I told you I didn't want any part in your schemes. I would never, ever hurt my sister. Briona? Did you know she was your real mother already? Not until after mom was gone. Then Emma told me everything. Sensing my confusion, Briona explained that Emma had a fling with our father many years ago, but he wouldn't marry her because of her lesser status. She was already pregnant with Briona at the time, so our father allowed her to stay as a nanny. When my mom married our dad, she only knew that Briona was her husband's stepchild. I'm sorry I didn't come clean sooner. I didn't know what to do, because I didn't realize how far she was willing to go. But when I saw her messing with your drink, I knew that I needed to at least warn you. Thank you for always being on my side and telling the truth now. It must have been even harder for you to process all these. But don't worry, we can still make this right. Emma was trying to explain away her crimes as the police escorted her away in handcuffs. They assured as justice would be served. We got in touch with mom, and by morning she was back home. After some more crying and apologizing and explaining and hugging, everything was as close to normal as it could be. I admitted that I didn't want the responsibility of running the company, but there was something I did want. I wanted to return to the Gem Island and oversee the exploration of the new mines. What I didn't say was the reason I really wanted to return. He was all I could think about as I embarked on my journey back to the island. We took a big boat as far as we could, before I needed to board a paddle boat to remain undetected once we reached native territory. Before I knew it, the island appeared on the horizon. My heart fluttered as I paddled faster and faster, waiting for the moment I could finally see Silas again. I was so focused on the land ahead that I didn't see the huge wave coming up from behind and overturned my boat. When I opened my eyes, I once again thought I was dead. This time, it was because the first thing I saw was an angel's face. 
Silas? Amy. Hi. I told you we'd see each other again. <laughs> but my moment in heaven was interrupted by the tribe's return. We were surrounded by the natives hollering and pounding their spears into the ground. A man angrier and more distinctively dressed than the rest stepped forward. This must be the chief. He shouted something to the others, and they grew quiet. He shouted some more, and all of their spears were pointed at me and Silas. I looked up at Silas. His face didn't change. He hugged me even tighter. Just when I thought the end was near, I heard a familiar voice. Nora was standing in between us and her father, shouting desperately. The chief's expression softened, and after some discussion between them, the chief gave another order, which made Silas very surprised. So, yes, thanks to Nora and all the good deeds that Silas has done for the tribe. They spared our lives, but they ordered us both to leave their territory right away. So Silas and I moved to the main island, where my family's gem mine is located. Here we still have the beauty and simplicity of the wild lifestyle, while being connected to the rest of the world and helping manage our family business. So it's okay that we're not allowed to stay on the tribe's island. Not to mention, we still have a friend who often comes to visit. Nora had nagged her father to allow her to come over to our island every few days. It was at first because of Silas, but I think that she has set her sights on someone new now. <laughs> Hi, I'm Vicky, the only daughter of a billionaire, also the sole heir from the third generation of an English aristocracy. Growing up, I was always referred to as Nepo Baby, but this is so unfair. If I had one sentence to sum up my entire life, it would be, well, that didn't go as planned. Before we start, please like and subscribe. I used to live the life of a princess. My house staff was on hand 24 hours to cater to all of my needs. And the biggest decision I had to make each day was to choose which car to go to school in. Still, I wasn't Regina George everyone wanted me to be. I was friendly to everyone and took both my education and my talent seriously. From an early age, I found a huge love for painting. You see, my daddy even invited global superstars over just so they could pose for me. Then, it struck me like a bolt of lightning when my daddy got involved in a messy lawsuit and ended up in jail. As a result, we had to kiss goodbye to everything. Yes, the mansion, the staff, but the worst blow was losing Brad, the butler's son, who happened to be my boyfriend. My sweetie pie, I will collect the stars from the skies if it leads me back to you. Well, a girl gotta survive, so I did what I had to. I sold all of my beloved clothes and jewelry, but holy cow, all those Pradas, Gucci's, and Tiffany's still weren't enough to cover a week in a five-star hotel. Hey, use this. Miss, your card has been declined. Clearly you have insufficient funds and therefore must leave. Excuse me? The nerve. The ingratitude. I used to be one of their best customers. It wasn't as if I was the second inventing Anna or anything. So that's how I ended up here, under this bridge full of homeless people, desperately waiting for Brad to come back to me. In the meantime, at least I still had my paintings, which could be my ticket out of here, right? But Jesus, look! Those people kept taking them to smash cockroaches, while others even used them as firewood! Then, one day, as my belly was arguing with me over the lack of food, this charity group showed up. They came to distribute food to the homeless. I scrambled to my feet to ask for some, but was stopped by this woman. Look at your flashy outfit. You can't take food off the needy. How inappropriate. No, no, no. I'm homeless too. Just then, a whiff of the Labo Santal 33 filled the air, and a luxurious lady emerged from the crowd. She waved off the mean woman, then peered at my drawing. Did you paint these? Yes. I've been painting since I was a child. I've painted everyone from Taylor Swift to Ronaldo. Impressive indeed. I'm Diana, a widow of a great fortune. How would you like to come and live with me in exchange for sharing your artistic brilliance in my daily portrait? I was speechless for a few secs, then agreed right away. I was obviously destined to be rich, so it seems I couldn't escape my fate. I arrived at the villa, thinking that this was awesome and I'd finally landed back on my feet. But then... The euphoria was replaced with a gut-wrenching blow when Diana introduced me to her fiancé. Brad? Right after the awkward introduction, I pulled Brad away and confronted him. How could you cheat on me like this? I'll tell Diana. We broke up. Besides, having exes is normal. If you tell Diana I'm your ex, then it's you she'll throw out, not me. I couldn't believe the cheek of this guy. And you know what? We never broke up. 
I just couldn't spend another moment stuck with this jerk, so I decided to paint Diana a portrait as a thank you and then leave forever. Only, she really loved my painting. Thinking back to those glum days under the bridge, I realized, well, Brad was here, but so was a warm bed, steady meals, and someone who genuinely loved my art. This place was big enough to avoid him anyway, right? So far, so good. Well, until one day. All I did was ask the maid to get me a clean paintbrush when a guy got all grouchy with me. You have legs, do it yourself. Who are you to talk to me like that? Soon to be the owner of this mansion? Any problem? Leave her alone. It's what the staff are here for anyway. The room suddenly bristled with tension as Brad and that guy exchanged hostile looks. Then he coldly walked away. Suddenly, Brad pulled me out to a corner. Vicky, sorry for hiding it from you, but I have no feelings for Diana. I'm here to spy on her, as she's the reason your father's in jail. I'm here to find evidence and help him regain his honor. Wow! What? I know, it's hard to believe, but I need to cooperate with me. That dude is Charles, Diana's son. He'll try to mess with me by all means, so we need to stop him before he does. It made sense now. I knew Brad loved me really and wouldn't pick some old woman over me. Then he told me his plan. He'd continue seducing Diana and persuade her to get me to tutor Charles. While I had to befriend Charles to get information out of him, I felt kind of nervous, but the chance to clear Daddy's name left me with no doubts. However, Charles wasn't the approachable type. He was so curt and rude. And no matter how wide I flashed my friendly smile, I always heard no more than six words from him. Let's do some still life painting today, shall we? You do what you want. I was trying my best to teach him, but he doodled on the page and always came up with the worst drawings I've ever seen. Then one day, he suddenly insisted we go outside for some outdoor portraits, and he to draw me. So my plan did work! Yes! I excitedly stood in the bay window and did an elegant pose. It was sweltering standing there, but I endured it for the art. But it had been four hours and he didn't seem to have finished. I couldn't stand any longer, so I rushed to him and dropped my jaw to see what his canvas was. Totally blank! I. Am. Furious! <sighs> Calm down, Vicky. Perhaps Charles was like an onion, with multiple layers waiting to be peeled away. So I decided to take a more psychological approach. I asked Diana for Charles's photo book and saw a family photo. This must be Charles's father. I'd paint it in the hope this thoughtful gesture would move him somehow. On Charles's birthday, I happily gave him the beautifully framed painting. Unexpectedly, upon seeing that, his face darkened and he had this fiery look in his eyes. He furiously threw the painting to the ground and yelled at me. Disappear! I can't stand you! What the? Fine then! Why is this guy gonna be so rude? I spent all week on that painting. What a psycho! I was packing my bags when Diana came into my room. She explained that the man in the photo wasn't Charles's father, but her ex-boyfriend. Charles's father died when he was little, then her ex was the one who had taken care of Charles since then. To Charles, he was the world. That kid was even closer to him than me, but then we broke up and he vanished without as much as a word. Charles has been hostile and distant ever since. I didn't know behind his rocky exterior was such a bitter truth, so I immediately found him. Charles, I I'm sorry. Go! I might look terrible now, but I was once my father's princess. He gave me everything I could ever ask for, except his time. My parents divorced early, and I was left alone. Just like you, Charles. This loneliness, this yearning for a family bond, I share with you. Seeing his hand loosen, I continued. My intention was never to belittle you. All I wanted was to burst the chasm of misunderstanding between us. Charles still stayed silent, but his facial muscles had relaxed. And when his gaze met mine, he slammed the door shut. So I decided to stay. And even though Charles continued being a grouch towards me, he stopped with the pranks. I also noticed that when Charles focused on something, he turned into a different person. He always stuck his tongue out, which looked adorable. Watching Charles drawing as if he was fighting with the paper, I came here and guided him, but suddenly our eyes met. He has such dreamy eyes. Oh no, Vicky, less of that. You were here to prove my daddy's innocence and get back to the old life. As for me and Brad, we had to make do with grabbing moments together when we could. When this is over, we can vow to be together forever and have a wedding more lavish than any of the Kardashians. My love, you must be patient. We will be together properly soon. However, when everyone was around, Brad kept up the lovey-dovey pretense with Diana. 
I knew it was totally fake, but I couldn't help but feel annoyed. I couldn't just sit there smiling like everything was peachy. So, after I finished the painting, I followed Brad, intending to ask him what the next step was after I successfully approached Charles, when I spotted him sneakily talking to someone. Hey, Pop. Yeah, Diana's like putty in my hand. Vicky complicated things, but I came up with a plan to deceive her. I thought that little pest would be long gone by now, but seems Charles hasn't kicked her out. Any ideas? The fury whirled like a tornado inside me. I instantly charged at him and smacked him in the face. What? You? Wait till Diana finds out about this. Oh yeah? If you challenge me, then be prepared to lose. Say hi to your bridge pals for me. I immediately found Diana and exposed all about Brad to her, but her face suddenly turned serious. I knew you'd say anything to divert from the truth, but I know you stole money from me. The maid found it in your room. Stole? What? What are you talking about? Then I looked at Brad and saw him smirking. That conniving mastermind! Before I could try and defend myself, a staff member hurried in and passed Diana a letter. Charles was missing! Everyone was freaking out and refused to hear me out, and the chaos left me powerless as my stuff was dumped outside the villa. I ended up right back where I started and had a complete meltdown. Worst of all, I was worried about Charles. Was he home yet? The next morning, I was trying to sketch something when out of nowhere, Charles appeared. He handed me the keys to this small but cozy apartment and told me it was all mine. Stunned and grateful also. I couldn't stand but hugged him hard. By the way, where did you go? Nowhere special. Felt suffocated, so I left. This time, Charles was like a different person towards me. He visited me every day and even helped me sell my paintings. Over time, my feelings for him grew and we started dating. Our relationship was filled with warmth and affection, and every moment spent together felt like a dream come true. Only, I felt so guilty keeping my dating history with Brad a secret from him, but the fear of losing him loomed over me. If he knew I'd approached him with hidden motives at the beginning, he'd despise me forever. But I had to at least tell him something. Be careful around Brad. I don't think he's a good guy. I know. He's a gold digger that's part of a romance scam ring, targeting rich women to blackmail them. Wow! Charles sure knew his stuff. Hang on, does it mean that Brad intended on blackmailing me too, when I'd been rich? I'm going to expose him at the wedding ceremony. Come with me. Today is D-Day. The Grand Hall was drowned in the ethereal glow of lights, standing in the center were Brad and Diana, ready to exchange lifelong vows. All eyes were fixed on them. Out of a sudden, the whole hall went dark, and an anonymous face appeared on the screen behind them. Tonight, we bring the spotlight on our group. Unbeknownst to many, our Brad Thomas is, in reality, Jackson North, born and raised in Pennsylvania by his father, Richie North, the ringleader of scams to trick rich women into marriage and con them out of their fortune. Then the evidence of Brad being affectionate with innocent victims started appearing on the screen. After that, the spotlight immediately stopped on Brad, who was about to flee the scene. Diana roared in anger, rushing there right then, and flung a glass of wine right at his face. The whole crowd started to murmur. Hang on, everyone. The party's not over yet. Check their menus to reveal the other accomplice. Everyone frantically checked, but then looked bewildered to see all the menus were empty. All except for mine, where there was a photo of me and Brad. So since the beginning, Charles already knew about my relationship with Brad? And he thinks I'm Brad's accomplice? I turned to Charles, but he immediately let go of my hand. We're over. This whole time, Charles played me like a hurtful trick, and even thought me capable of something truly awful. I messaged him to meet me by this lake where we used to go. It had been one hour, but he hadn't shown up. This might be the final nail in the coffin of our relationship. Just as I was about to let go, I saw him trudging towards me. Charles, listen to me. I'm not with Brad. I tried warning you about him. I heard the whole sneaky conversation of you two. Your love words and your filthy plan on my family. Then my private detective sent me those photos of you both together that proved me right. You hired someone to spy on me? Not you, Brad. That's why I left home. I thought you were my friend. And I thought we were more than friends. Brad and I did date in the past, but that's all. He tried to use me just like he used others. My feelings for you are real. You have to trust me. So? I didn't know about the scam. 
I'm sorry I ever fell for Brad's lies and first approached you. He told me your mom was involved with my father's downfall, and I guess I still wanted my daddy to be innocent that I stupidly believed him. Charles didn't utter a word. He just turned around and left. But hang on! May I ask, why didn't you publicize my face in that picture with Brad? I just wanted you to know what it felt like to be hurt. But I couldn't bear to see you hurt either. Let me go. I need some time. Then he left me there, watching him disappear in the dark, as the world around me collapsed. After the rain, the sun finally shines again. The police finally caught up with Brad and his dad and locked them both up. Diana tracked me down and apologized to me. She asked me to go back to the villa and paint for her, but I refused. I can't keep on being so trusting and relying on others so much. It's time for me to believe in myself and stand on my own two feet. And more importantly, I couldn't face him anymore. Hi, it's Vicky again, but in a fancier version. After all the sweat and tears, I finally made it as an artist. I was just chosen to collaborate on an important art project with this big company, and my life would turn a new page upon opening this door. Charles. Hey, welcome to my coffee booth at Felton High's Flea Market. Just a second, I need to add the finishing touches to this latte. Perfect. Guys, try this. It's the special drink that I came up with for our two-month anniversary, which, FYI, is today. How romantic. What's the name of this drink? I think Patrick should name it. We can call that Paige's Vom. You know, because it reminds me of when we were five and you threw up in the back of my mom's car during our road trip. <laughs> Stop! I'm not kidding! Me neither. It's one of my favorite memories, as that's when I fell deeply in love with you. Or how about, why is everything a joke to you? Just leave. We're done. I'm sorry about that. Ugh, let's start over. I'm Paige, and everyone calls me Perfect Paige, because, well, everything about me is perfect. That must be thanks to my parents. My dad's a hospital director, and my mom's a university president. They both excel in their jobs, juggle family affairs, never quarrel, and always have smiles on their faces. In me, I'm beautiful, smart, and have some talents, such as making drinks. My dream is to run my own coffee shop, on the side of the dream job at the national TV station that I will definitely get. Then I'll come home to my dream boyfriend who's a flawless man that I can count on, and we'll have a perfect love story like my parents. Then why did I choose that funny guy as my boyfriend, you ask? Ugh. Before he became my now ex, Patrick was a close friend since childhood. We lived in the same neighborhood, and it was my friend Doris's birthday, but she came up with a stupid condition that all the girls had to bring along a boy. Ugh, please. This sounded ridiculous, so I presumed it was a joke and showed up alone. Only everyone else had a plus one with them. Paige, you need to stop being so picky and give a guy a chance. How about your bestie Patrick? He's nice, smart, great at basketball, and he's pretty cute, right? No, 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 we go way back. He's all right, I guess, but that's not enough. I, there's no one on this planet who can reach your ridiculously high standards. He's the best you're gonna get, and look, he's also so funny. Patrick's sense of humor is by far his most infuriating trait. Fine, perfect page, you'll just have to show up to the prom alone then, and I doubt that's a perfect thing to do. I guess Doris's words played on my mind, because when Patrick walked me home, I blurted out, Hey, if we're both single after we turn 17, then let's date. Then my perfect school year will end with a perfect prom night with my high school sweetheart, just like in a rom-com. Huh? Have you eaten too much frosting or something? No, of course not. I just can't possibly turn up to prom dateless. Oh, the outrage. As if anyone could ever dare to go to prom without a date. But I'm not just anyone. Such a humiliating thing would be a scratch on the diamond, which is me. Okay, okay. I'll do whatever you want. Time passed by and I concentrated on my studies and my hobby. Then before I knew it, I turned 17 and still didn't have a boyfriend. I heard this strange noise coming from my balcony. Patrick? What is he doing with a rose in his mouth? Hey there, do you remember our oath once upon a time? Okay, fine. From today, I allow you to be my boyfriend. Go home and get ready. Tonight will be our first date. Wait, you serious? It's not a joke. Why are you always joking? All right, all right. Where does my love want to go on our first date? 
So we started dating and so far so good. Seeing as he'd known me for years, he knew what I liked and what I was thinking. He never argued with me and just did what I asked. And best of all, everyone complimented us and said we were a match made in heaven. There was just one problem. Patrick's sense of humor was ruining the romantic vibe. So that brings us to the present and why I ended our relationship. Later that night, Patrick called and apologized, but I confirmed that the breakup was still on as I didn't want to cause strain to our friendship. He seemed pretty surprised by this, but Patrick being Patrick, he soon made light of it. Back to the friend zone. Alrighty. So no need to pick up Paige every morning anymore. Nice. See you in math class. For some reason, I was a little sad that he'd agreed to do this so quickly, but it had just been a dumb fling anyway, right? But hang on, what about prom? I couldn't lose face with my friends, so I joined a dating app to continue the search for my Prince Charming. Ugh, too short, too nerdy, too glary. And after days of desperately swiping, I finally found a guy that caught my eye. I mean, I couldn't really see his face, but he had to be hot. I messaged him right away, and you know what? We got on so well and soon arranged a date. I fixed my hair one more time and walked over to him. Hello, you. <gasps> Patrick? Surprise, my bae. I'm your perfect mystery partner. Patrick, I swear to God. How do you feel? Angry much, huh? Then now you know how my poor heart felt when you broke it to pieces. <laughs> I was fuming, but Patrick kept up his annoying grin. So you're that starving for love? All right, I know your ideal type way too well. Let me find you a guy. You know, attractive boys tend to hang out in a herd. We'll see. You know, being handsome is only one thing on my list. The first candidate was this guy called Beavis, the basketball team captain. We started talking, and it went well enough for him to invite me to go watch his game. He even winked at me before he scored a perfect three-pointer. All the jealous glances turned to me. Looks like Patrick really found me a good deal. At first, this was kind of cool, but soon all of the love letters and gifts Beavis received got kind of grating. Worst of all, he accepted them all. He didn't seem to be faithful at all. Also, his grades really sucked, and he was always so sweaty. This first candidate is out. Next was Daniel, a cute genius who liked to invent things. I really love how passionate he looks when he's working on something. He's so talented. But he always showed up late to our date with the excuse there was some machine malfunction. His clothes were always stained with grease, and all he talked about was research. Oh, actually, I have zero idea what you're on about. You're so robotic. I went home and already saw Patrick making himself at home in our living room. He must have heard the news. So, sporty boy has too many fangirls. No good. Mechanic boy is too busy. No good. Then maybe a rich boy with a lot of free time could treat you like a princess. Patrick introduced me to this guy called Eric, the school rich kid who showered me with lavish gifts. That was nice, but then his clinginess felt suffocating. He always seemed to be there, and he wouldn't quit calling and texting me. He also spent longer than I did getting ready. No thanks. Why? You're too clingy. If you have too much time on your hands, then why don't you go do something useful? What? I only cling on to you because I care. But I guess I was just wasting my time on useless things because you're just a stubborn, spoiled girl that finds fault in everything and doesn't appreciate other people's feelings. No one's ever spoken to me like that before. Useless? Stubborn? Spoiled? Eric's words were still echoing in my head as I walked home. Then I saw Patrick approaching. What's up? Who got you mad this time? Is it Eric? His downside is being too rich, isn't he? Not Eric, it's you. You deliberately set me up with those weirdos, didn't you? What are you saying? I only chose the guys that suit you best. No, they don't. I don't think you really understand me at all. Oh, really? How well do you understand me then? If you're that confident, then go find me an ideal girlfriend. Fine, maybe you'll quit bugging me if you're taken. Hmm, turns out trying to find a girlfriend for Patrick was trickier than I thought. He's so friendly with everyone, I actually have no idea what his type is. Whatever, he made no effort to find me a nice guy anyway, so I'll just return the favor. Nope, nope, nope. Oh, Nina, I know her, a scandalous hot girl who always goes overboard on the wax statue makeup. I'm pretty sure she likes Patrick, as she's always cheering him from the sidelines during his games. Patrick, let's see what fun date you can have with this girl. The next day, I walked straight up to Nina and asked her if she wanted to go on a date with Patrick. She looked kind of surprised, but then after thinking it over, she agreed. They met at a cafe, and after I introduced them to each other, I sat at a nearby table and observed. I expected things between them to be super awkward, but surprisingly, they seemed to get along quite well.
I couldn't hear what they were saying, but they kept bursting out laughing. They acted like they'd known each other for ages. Patrick and Nina bid farewell, and as soon as Nina walked away, I jumped out and asked, How can you have fun chatting with Nina all night? Don't you see her laughing out loud? That's not very ladylike. So she's fun. Everyone has flaws, though I don't even think it's a flaw. It's cute. Fine. Let's see how long you two can have fun. But in the following days, I still saw Patrick with Nina. Then at school, I overheard Nina talking to her friends. Tonight? No wonder you've been looking so happy all day. Of course, it's going to be a big confession. Huh? They've only been dating for five minutes. I wonder why Patrick liked Nina that much. So I decided to stalk them. I followed them to this posh restaurant. Ugh, so humiliating. Who would have thought that Perfect Page would do something like this? But there is no way back now. They spoke for a bit, then Patrick went to answer a phone call. I thought he was going to plan his confession or something. But then, to my surprise, a man swooped in and sat down with his arm around Nina. That's Beavis! What? How could they be so shameless? I quickly ran to find Patrick, who was chilling in a corner, so I quickly pulled him back to the table. Look, you're being cheated on! Cheated on? What do you mean? The girl who's been clinging on to you for days has been flirting with your teammate. Stop playing dumb, please. Nina is just my friend. She likes Beavis, not me. Nina clearly likes you. She follows you to every game. How could she switch to Beavis out of nowhere? You should defend me, not a stranger like her. Did you forget Patrick and I are teammates? Nina was actually there for me. I agreed to meet Patrick just because I wanted to ask him to talk to Beavis for me. Sorry for misleading you. <laughs> What's with a bulldog's frown? We just successfully match made a couple. Let's go give the lovebirds some private space. I guess you'll have to find me another girl. Don't act like we're close. I don't want a flippant and heartless friend like you. You're the heartless one. You're making a mess with your ridiculous standards and expect others to follow all of that. Then act like a victim? Don't you see how Patrick is the real casualty here? He tended to your absurd needs. Even helped you get a boyfriend, yet all you do is treat him like garbage. Selfish Paige. You're not as perfect as you think. What? What do you know? You're just a plastic girl after all. Yeah, I might be plastic, but at least I realize what my flaws are to try to fix them. Unlike you, you call yourself a diamond when actually you're just a silly pebble. Was this really what people thought of me? I couldn't believe anyone would ever describe me with such ugly words. <laughs> I ran home and shut myself away in my room. It made me so distraught knowing that other people thought I was bad like that. Mom came into my room to check on me, and I ended up blurting everything to her. How everyone seemed to hate me now. How I might be alone for the rest of my life without finding my perfect other half, and having a happy ending like mom and dad. Sweetie, everyone has flaws. I do, and so does your father. I can have quite the temper, but your dad always knows what to say and do to calm me down. While he is terrible at being romantic, so I have to give him hints now and then. Point is, we accept and love each other, flaws and all. That's the secret to a long and happy marriage. Talking to mom really helped me understand that no one is perfect, and therefore my standards are unreasonable. I had some apologizing to do. I texted Beavis, Daniel, Eric, and Nina. Beavis replied straight away, telling me he was sorry too for what he said, but it came from a good place, and he's sure that I was better than that because he trusts Patrick's eye for people. Now there was just one last apology for me to make, and I needed to do this one in person. Oh, looks like he already found me. Hey, shoddy. Are you looking for me? The most handsome guy in town. Please stop. I came to talk to you about something serious. Uh, I came to see you too. Trust me, I didn't match you with those silly guys on purpose. In no way do I want to hurt you. Because, because I like you, Paige. For real. Since when? I, I just thought we were just good friends. Since we started dating. At first, I just went along with it. But gradually, I found myself having real feelings for you. I'm so sorry for causing you trouble. Being around you makes my head fuzzy. I always crack jokes just because I want to make you smile, but turns out you don't feel the same. I will try to keep it down from now on. No, I'm sorry too. You don't have to change anything for me. It's the real you after all. I've truly learned it now. Nobody's perfect, and it's the way people complete each other's imperfections with their personality differences that tighten their relationships. And maybe being perfect is my imperfection. So now you have my permission to offset it with your annoying unseriousness. So where were we as a couple? Ha, <laughs> oh right, Paige's vomit. Shall we go home and make that signature drink again? <laughs> Just kidding.